580 Sports Talk going up on a Tuesday. Brendan Dworzynski, Dan Lucero, Spencer Dupuy here with you until 6 o'clock today. Got a full show coming your way. Plenty of Royals baseball to get to. The White Sox get shut out by the Royals. That has now happened to the Chicago franchise six times. They've played 16 games. That hasn't happened in well over 100 years. We will get to the Brooklyn Superbas coming up in a little bit. And the excellent, excellent outing by Seth Lugo. We'll get to that coming up here in just a few moments. One Royal who is having, frankly, a hilarious start to the season. We'll get to him coming up later on this hour. Also, a piece from yesterday. This actually was posted prior to the White Sox versus Royals game. It went up uh, yesterday afternoon from Dan's boy, Dan Zimborski, over at Fangraphs. Oh, yeah. My boy. Yeah. yeah. Dan Lucero, number one fan of all I chart at Fangraphs. But about the Royals and how no team in baseball to this point has had a greater change in their playoff odds than the Kansas City Royals from prior to opening day to today. And whether or not maybe we should actually be willing to believe in this Royals team this year. That's coming up here later on in the show. Plenty of NFL to get to. We'll talk about the quarterback class for this year's draft in the 3 o'clock hour. We'll get to the Chiefs and their need at wide receiver as well. What type of wide receiver the Chiefs need at some point in the draft this year. We've got some college basketball to get to. Wild numbers from the transfer portal. Evan Miyakawa, who runs EvanMia.com. Uh, he is a college basketball analytics writer. He has compiled the percentage of minutes played and the percentage of players from every conference that have entered the portal. Some of these numbers are staggering. This is the new, like we've all heard, oh, X number of players is in the portal. When I hear 2,400 players or whatever, that means nothing to me. I, I can't conceptualize that. You tell me though, 40% of the Southland conference is transferring. That sounds like a lot to me. That I can conceptualize and say, what the hell? That is a lot. <laughs> so we will get to that coming up in the three and four o'clock hours today. Michael Swain is going to join us for Jayhawk Weekly in the four o'clock hour. We've got what is wrong with you, random question Tuesday. All that and much more today on 580 Sports Talk. We'd love for you to be a part of the show. You know how to do that either on the text line, the Top City Metal Supply text line, 785-272-9429, or in the YouTube comments, the YouTube stream, 580 Sports Talk on YouTube. We are 21 subscribers away from 500. We'll do something fun when we eventually get there. At least Dan and Spencer will, because it'll probably mean I'm out of the room. But when we get to 500, we'll do something fun. 580 Sports Talk is the name of our YouTube channel. We've got your keyword for you now. Two o'clock hour keyword for the Alpha Media Choose Your Trip Contest. Head over to 580WIBW.com. Click on Choose Your Trip 2024 and enter this keyword between now and three o'clock. Your keyword is prize. P-R-I-Z-E, prize. So again, that's at 580WIBW.com. Click on Choose Your Trip, and you can enter the word prize for just this hour. There'll be a new one at the top of the 3 o'clock hour for your chance to win a trip to anywhere that you would like to go. Before we start with Royals baseball today, though, we wanted to make sure we send uh, we, we said something about and sent our well wishes, thoughts, prayers to uh, Greg Sharp, who, if you are a longtime listener of sports here on 580 WIBW, if you are a Kansas State fan of a certain vintage, if you know anything about sports broadcasting in this part of the country, or certainly current days, if you are a fan of the Nebraska Cornhuskers, the voice of the Huskers, uh, Greg Sharp announced yesterday during a show that uh, he is going through treatment for cancer. And he said he didn't want to get into a a lot of specifics. He mentioned that it was in the pancreatic region, but said he didn't want to get into all the medical mumbo jumbo about it, but did want to make it clear he's not going to do uh, his full schedule of games for Nebraska baseball. And he said he was the true play-by-play -play broadcaster to the, to the core, said, I, I hate it. This team is so fun. I wish I could be there for it. Uh, who knows what this is going to mean for uh, Nebraska football on the radio come the fall, but uh, I know we're thinking of Greg Sharp. None of us have, have, well, as far as I'm aware, Dan, none of us have met Greg personally, um, but have heard a lot of stories from Jake, have heard them from Bruce Steinbrock, have heard them from Mark Elliott and all the various other people who have 
uh, been here and been through 580 over the years know that Greg Sharp means a whole lot to a whole lot of people in this area. Uh, so just wanted to to send our our thoughts, best wishes, and you know all all the strength we can to Greg Sharp as he goes through cancer treatment. We're a 90 plus year old radio station here, 580 WIBW. So there are a lot of links in the chain. You know, from us, you go back to Jake LeBon. Jake LeBon goes back to Greg Sharp, and Greg Sharp goes back to Steve Fiziak and, and Ron Paredes, and and uh, so many names and, and so many people who've been involved with making WIBW what it is and what it has meant to people in this area for so long. So uh, even though we don't know Greg Sharp personally, we've all heard his work. We're all familiar with his work as as a broadcaster and uh, know how much he is still well thought of, well regarded in the uh, the K-State community uh, as with the long time that he spent as their broadcast voice. And so, uh, yeah, uh, we, we heard from, uh, some people yesterday, uh, that, uh, called that to our attention and we wanted to make sure that, uh, we did on everyone's behalf here, wish, uh, him and his entire family, the very best to say, go through this fight and, uh, kick that thing's ass, Greg. Yeah, no, uh, we'll, we'll talk to Fitz a little about this. Cause I know he knows Greg Sharp a, a whole bunch, uh, from their respective K-State days. Uh, Fitz will join us on the show tomorrow. I know this is obviously personal for Fitz, given his um, his personal battle with cancer as well. So I know this affects so many people. It's affecting Greg Sharp. So if you are the praying type, maybe send a few up. If you just want to send some strong thoughts, strong vibes, uh, and best wishes to Greg Sharp, I'm sure his family would appreciate that as well. We do have some baseball to get to. The Kansas City Royals with a big win yesterday, 2-0 over the Chicago White Sox. We will get to their pathetic opponents here in a moment because I feel like We have to bring up how atrocious they are. But on another night when the offense had a little bad luck and just wasn't great against a first-time starter in uh, in Nick Nostrini. Was it Nick Nostrini? Was that his name? Yes. Um, Who was pretty good, I thought, all things considered. Seth Lugo just mowed down an overmatched White Sox team. Seven shutout innings, only gave up four hits, one walk, Struck out four. That actually raised up his K per nine. He was at, what was it, 4.3 entering yesterday. So now, after that, he's up slightly. Maybe a hundredth of a point, but he's up slightly in that metric. The thing that encouraged me the most about Lugo yesterday, though, he faced 25 at-bats. He also had the one walk, but 25 at-bats against Seth Lugo yesterday. Only Five batted balls in play qualified as hard hits. That's exit velocity of 95 uh, 95 miles an hour or harder. Only five of them. And if you were going to make that threshold 96, you you would take off two. Two of them were 95.2 and 95.3 off the bat. That's 20%. That's essentially what Corbin Carroll is doing this year for the Diamondbacks. And while I like Corbin Carroll... Uh, not exactly a great start to the year for the former NL Rookie of the Year. That's what Seth Lugo was doing yesterday. And I frankly don't want to hear that, yeah, but it's the White Sox. Come on. I know like we're, we're dealing with BRS at this point, battered royal syndrome. Like that That's how a lot of fans feel after the last few years. And let's be fair, most of Royals history, save for a few years and a couple different decades. But this team, this pitching staff is legitimately good. And I don't want to hear the, yeah, but the White Sox thing. You're still going to lose 80 plus games this year in all likelihood. Every team in Major League Baseball loses 60 or more. You're going to lose some games. It's hard to win every single day, game in, game out. It's baseball. Things happen. You should a team out. You're doing something right, even if it seems that gets shut out all the time. So I was really impressed by Lugo. And the fact that he's not giving up a ton of hard contact while also not striking out a bunch of guys like if you're not missing bats and then the other team is going to hit it 98 miles an hour off the bat every time okay this is like this is a fluke you're not going to continue pitching this well but the fact that there's a lot of medium and soft contact that tells me something positive that he's still getting his stuff to work even if it's not blowing anyone away i think too when it can help you get out of innings and get further into the game Mm -hmm. that's the biggest plus of it all yeah that, that, might, that might be the best thing that he's yeah. offered to this point is is getting into the sixth and the seventh inning each time he goes out there. Yeah, because you can get those soft ball or soft ground balls 
if you have good defense, which so far most of the time the Royals defense seems to be very good. I mean, obviously every team's going to have an error, Mm -hmm. but no matter how you face it, they're, they're playing really good baseball right now. And it starts with the pitching. Yeah. And I, I've been very impressed by, by Lugo and I, I see why he was slotted in as number two, just in the opening rotation to start the year. So that was my big takeaway. Not a great day for the offense. Obviously, you only got the two runs. Vinny, it, Vinny's here. Which, yeah, he's back. Man. He's yeah, crushing the baseball. It took a little while to get up to speed and facing pitchers a couple of times, and now he's he's back. Vin, and, this is the Vinny Pasquantino over the last week that we all expected we would have this year. Yeah, and this is what we saw before he got hurt last year. You remember he got off to a really nice start last year, and I know the start was slow this year, but I mean he missed four months. He really was just getting back to seeing live pitching for the first time in spring training. So natural that it maybe took him an extra week or so to get back in the swing, pun intended. And uh, now he's hammering the baseball and driving it with authority and uh, being that middle of the order bat. Certainly last night, the Royals missed Salvador Perez, missed his presence. He'd been hot in the middle of that lineup, but Vinny able to pick up the slack. They get the insurance run late. Isbell driving in a run. Always nice when you can get a bottom of the order contribution. And then after Lugo, good work from the bullpen. Mm-hmm. Uh, green, one, two, three, eighth for Chris Stratton. That, I think that's huge. That's the value of having veterans, Spencer, is uh, is when you have a guy who has a bad outing, like Stratton did. Stratton took the loss on Sunday. Yep. You can run him right back out there. And Stratton's been a guy who knows the ups and downs, the ebbs and flows of being a big league reliever. And he's not going to have his confidence dented by one bad outing. You roll him right back out there the next day. And given his historical workload, he just might be one of those guys that needs to pitch a lot to to be really effective. Some guys are like that. Some guys, the more you throw them, the better they get. Like in his prime, Brian Shaw was a guy like that. Remember him with uh, Cleveland? (laughs) Oh, yeah. When he was really good with Cleveland. Um he pitched every day, it felt like. Eddie Guardado. Every day, Eddie. Remember him with the <laughs> Eddie <twins>? Guardado. Oh, yeah. <laughs> We're remembering some guys now. They're all AL Central guys. That's not a mistake. I'm trying to relate to the audience here. You remember these guys. The more you pitch, the better you are. And and Stratton might just be, given his, uh, his history, one of those guys. So valuable to have a, a veteran in that slot that you can say, hey, we're not worried about what happened Sunday. Let's go out there and get the job done on this Monday. He pitched well. MacArthur locked down the ninth inning. And the White Sox are shut out for the sixth time in 16 games, which is frankly incredible. Not in a good way, but it's incredible. It is yeah. incredible. I think, too, that goes to a lot to say about uh, how Quatrero feels about it. Mm-hmm. Just because he has a bad outing, they lose the game. He's the culprit of them losing the game uh, when it comes to the pitching. He says, you know what, I'm going to throw him right back out there tomorrow, and he's going to get that bad taste out of his mouth, and we can move forward. And I think that's huge for a pitching staff. A bullpen that struggled – for a week there, uh, the the back end of the mm-hmm. bullpen really struggled there, and they've been pretty good of late. But when that happens, and you say we've got the confidence to throw you back out there, and you're gonna turn mm-hmm. go 180, that's gonna help you going forward throughout the season. And to the point, Dan, that you made about having veterans that know the ebb and flow of it, Chris Stratton at this point in his career probably not worried about losing his job. You know, young pitchers when they get in that stretch where maybe you're not throwing so well, you're missing your spots, you don't have your velocity, whatever, you maybe are feeling more like, oh, shoot, I if I don't pitch perfectly this time, if I don't throw an immaculate inning my next time out, I'm not going to get, I'm not going to get a next time. I'm going to be into a low leverage situation guy, and then maybe I'm not going to be used at all. Chris Stratton is not worried about that. A guy who has played for now six teams in nine years in his major league career. He's been on championship teams. He's been on crappy teams. He has seen it all at this point. So, yeah, those guys I don't think are going to fall too low. I, I just really like that this team is not one note. They can win in a variety of ways. They can win when it's 11 to 7, like on Saturday, when they have to hit the ball really well, be good in situational hitting bring guys around, manufacture runs, power, whatever. They can win games like that. They can also win games that are pitcher's duels that they've got to go out. And and I give credit to Nostrini, man. That's not an easy matchup for a team that stinks your first time up against a team that has been crushing you all year. To go out there and pitch as well as he did, I, I was very impressed by that. But the fact that you can say, hey, we can just pair up Lugo and two relievers and we can shut down a team or insert Reagans, insert Singer, some games Waka. We can insert one of those guys, have just a couple of bullpen arms go out there and win this game for us. 
That is something the Royals have not had in a long time, certainly not last year, which is the most recent counterexample to that. The White Sox, to the point you just made, um, the last time that a team played 16 games to start a season and were shut out in six of them was 1907. The Brooklyn Superbas were the team. That, that's now the Dodgers. Do you know what a Superba is? Um, no, I, I don't. Superba is a Latin adjective meaning superb. So <laughs> originally, the Brooklyn Baseball Club was known as the Brooklyn Hartfords uh, because they moved from Hartford. Uh, they were renamed the Grays because they wore gray. Then, after they won the American Association Championship in 1889, some newspaper writers referred to them as the Bridegrooms because they had six players get married over the course of a season. I did not know that's where that name came from. <laughs> so, yes, uh, they were familiarly uh, known as the Bridegrooms, and then they were combined with a National League team known as the Baltimore Orioles, not those Baltimore Orioles, mm -hmm. different Baltimore Orioles from the old National League. They were combined with the Brooklyn team, and they were dubbed the Superbas, also by the media. The media used to name teams all the time. Yes. Um, and they were named the Superbas, inspired by the popular circus act, the Hanlon's Superba. Superba. And uh, that's where it came from. They were the Superbas. I love stories like like people in newspapers used to just come up with nicknames for teams like, oh, that scrappy bunch of bulldogs. And now they're called bulldogs 100 years later. Right. That's very funny. Uh, they were also the Robins for uh, a long time because uh, their manager was Wilbert Robinson. So uh, they were the Robins from 1914 to 1931. <laughs> That's very funny. They've got a great history of names. And Dodgers, of course, was shortened from trolley dodgers mm -hmm. <laughs> that's really funny i uh i did not know that history of the dodgers name uh i had never heard of these superbas until last night it's just it's jarring how awful they are and the fact that they brought in a new front office well a new head of their front office they promoted chris Getz, and yet did nothing like you know you know what they've done to add pieces all the dudes who are still always injured, they are injured again. They kept Pedro Grafal, who is so overmatched as a manager. They brought back Mike Clevenger, who is a dirtbag and just not very good. They went out and signed Tommy Pham yesterday. Like the, Robbie Grossman is leading off some games for them. This is who the White Sox are. In the year of our Lord, 2020. Ozzy Guillen on the post game. Uh, oh, NBC no. Sports Chicago. I did not. He's, he's, oh, no. He's talking about all the guys that the White Sox have of their current regulars, guys who play the most games at their respective positions who are current regulars. They've only got two guys hitting above 200. Yeah, a bunch of dudes hitting in, in the 100s. And, and Ozzy Guillen said, in, and uh, I won't even come close to trying to imitate the way Ozzy speaks because only Ozzy talks like Ozzy. Yes. Uh, he says, you know, it's hard to hit 300, but it's even harder to hit 090. <laughs> Man, that is so <laughs> Ozzy. I know he captivated the baseball world in general when he was managing the White Sox and then that brief disastrous stint with the Marlins. When he was in Chicago, the grip he had on everyone's attention was unbelievable. He was such an iconoclast in Chicago, and he's still beloved. Oh, I believe it. There are a lot of people who really wanted Reinsdorf to rehire him instead of Pedro Grafal last year. Look, they've only won one championship since color television, and he was the manager. So naturally, he's mm -hmm. going to be pretty beloved. That goes like... We all know that the the Cubs have a rather star-crossed history. Mm -hmm. Not a lot like the White Sox have tallied up the championships. No, no. <laughs> they've, got, they've got one since World War II. They got one since World War I, for goodness sake. Um, yes. The other thing. The Doughboys hadn't even crossed the Atlantic the last time the White Sox 
had won a World Series before 05. It was 1917. Yeah. Um, yeah, I guess the Doughboys did cross that uh, year. In fact, it was a year before the the Red Sox won their last one before they finally won in 04. <laughs> yeah, and everybody. Oh, curse of the Bambino, most cursed franchise. And the, and the White Sox are just sitting there like, man, we've got it even worse. Uh, they also would go on uh, Gian and whoever the host is on their post game show to say, hey, Ben and showed some life tonight. As in Andrew Ben and who had two singles last night to raise his season long OPS to 409. That wow. OPS. That's not on base percentage. That's oh not slugging average. Geez. That is OPS. <laughs> 409. This guy was an all-star three years ago. Yeah. He's he is the highest paid free agent signing in the history of the Chicago White Sox. And so now what you're saying is you're for, further solidifying that the White Sox are worse than the athletics the a's whatever you want to call it. They very this well year yes be. they very well could be the a's have punched above their weight probably a little bit to start this year but they're not this two and 14 that is miserable and yes the royals have 11 wins five of them are against the white Sox. so i understand if that is something the skeptic would point to and say, yeah, it's great to be 11 and six, but they're six and six against everybody who isn't the White Sox. And the White Sox look like doo doo garbage. And that is true. That is an entirely fair thing to point out. But you know who was doo doo garbage last year? The Royals. I was going to say, I'll take 500. And if they have <laughs> surpassed that level of doo doo garbage and are leaving that level of doo doo garbage in a heap on the pavement, which is what they have done to the mm -hmm. White Sox in the first five of their 13 meetings this year. That's a good sign. That means that whatever the Royals are, again, it's too early to say what they are. I firmly still believe that. But I think we can say what they're not, and you can look at the White Sox and say, well, that's what they're not. Mm -hmm. That's what the Royals aren't, is this mess. You missed another one of the great quotes from Ozzy, by the way, where he said, uh, if, yeah, if I was a pitcher, I'd say, Skip, can you skip me? I want to face the White Sox. <laughs> this man loves that franchise, by the way. I, I'm telling you, as many times as he clashed with management, he loved the White Sox and still does. That's why they hired him and his sometimes difficult to understand thick Caribbean accent to be a part of their broadcast team. So the White Sox are two and 14. They're just, they're one of just 10 teams to start a season with only two wins in their first 14 games. Only four teams since 1907 have had a worse start. The 1969 Cleveland ball club went one in 15. The 1988 Baltimore Orioles lost their first 18 games of the season, I believe. Well, it might have been their first 19. It's not great. But they were 0-16 to start. Uh, the 3 Detroit Tigers, who lost 119 games, mm -hmm. they started 1-15. Also the 1992 Royals. They started 1-15 as well. It's not great. So, yeah, that's that's not uh, what you want. The uh, Superbas, by the way, started 1-14-1 in 1907. Love when baseball had ties. Bring that back. <laughs> it got too dark to play. <laughs> Return. Bring that back. <laughs> the White Sox would love that. They would love to, you know, maybe Ryan Storff will quit play, paying their light bill. And they just, they can't, we can't play anymore. I mean, the funny thing about that, you mentioned Ben Benintendi, the highest paid free agent they've ever signed. He will use this as example. Why, why would I pay that much when I can get better production out of cheaper guys? That will happen. And I know because I am a fan of the other team he owns, and that's kind of always how it works. We'll talk some more Royals baseball coming up next, including a very funny, although maybe not good, to start for another Royal position player. We've also got some college basketball to get to this hour here on 5 Sports Talk.
vibes are just so great when there's good baseball to talk about and to watch. And that a fact. I was thinking about it this morning, and I am in a very fortunate, and I won't talk about it too much, boat, because my favorite team is playing decently well. Won a game the Cubs should not have won yesterday. When you can tie a game in the ninth inning on a two-base wild pitch, it's very fun, but also very... When is the other shoe going to drop? Because we did not deserve this one. (laughs) That's just how baseball works sometimes. I feel that. But between them being good and being happy last night and the last couple games, the Royals playing really well for the first time since I have worked here. And I mean, the first time since the Royals were contending for World Series. It's fun. Like this time of year feels so much more exciting and fun when there's actual good baseball to talk about. It is really nice to be able to turn on the TV and there's a good ball game on. Yeah. Like like I I want to sit down and see what Brady Singer does tonight. Like I'm genuinely curious to see uh, how this lineup fares against uh, the rookie cannon that uh, the White Sox are scheduled to throw tonight. It does. Put the hop in your step when your team is good. You, you, You look at the schedule. You start maybe planning your evening around first pitch. Like it does. It uh, it puts a pep in your step. Hey, uh, remember yesterday when I had to get something off my chest? <laughs> yes, I do very well. Did you uh, did you see what the Nats did yesterday? No, I do not make a habit on checking in on the Washington <laughs> Nationals, Spencer. <laughs> they uh they went and beat the Dodgers six to four. Hey, in uh the first win for a major league debut for one of their pitchers since Steven Strasburg in 2010. Oh, that seems like a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> Mitch Parker, who's not even like a big time prospect. He uh he got the win yesterday in five innings, give up four hits, two runs. Uh not and, bad. Yeah, and that's the first win for a starter in their debut since 2010. Dodgers aren't great. They're good. No, but a, a rookie, gr- a, a no, guy I'm that's impressive not, for him. Yeah. Yeah, like a guy that's not like a top prospect that they needed to start because of sure. one of your best pitchers. Yeah, they've lost uh, four or five, the Dodgers. Yeah. But, uh, and I, I didn't mean to I take just away. Thought, yeah, I didn't I just, take away from No, that. no, I just no, thought I, that, honestly, he was going to get beat up because it's the Dodgers. It's the Dodgers, yeah. And the lineup that they have will do it. Mookie and Shohei and all yeah. those guys. No, I, I watched the, the Sunday night game when they lost to the Padres, and I thought, mm, that's, I don't know how impressive this, this staff is, but they've had pitching problems for a couple of years now. The offense has not been the issue, but the, the pitching... I, I have some questions. Kershaw will be back eventually. I love yeah. Clayton Kershaw. Glass now gave up all six yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. Not five good. innings for him, which is not good. Maybe we heard from Tyler Glass now yesterday. Maybe he should have just thrown harder. Uh, one <laughs> hit comment. A, hit a spot, Tyler. <laughs> couple comments here from Trevor on YouTube regarding the Pasquatch. Vinny Pasquantino. One says Pasquatch sightings are growing rapidly. That is a fact. Also adds, Vinny's post-game interview last night was legit. He said something about, we're a good team. We're going to compete with everyone. So exciting. Yeah, that's good. That's the feeling that is back with this Royals team that we talked about, I think it was late last week, that it this team is acting like they don't know what it's like to be that crappy. And that's good. That's a really, really good thing for this team. You want that. You want that to be the identity. And they're still really young. Vinny is young. Garcia is young. Witt is obviously young. Melendez, it feels like he's been around forever, but he's still really young. Salvi has the personality of a young guy. That's a good thing. That is a real positive thing. Not even to speak of uh, Cole Reagans, who I think is younger than Singer, but they're right around the same age. Yeah, he's younger. He's a year younger. Like, that's, those are good. Alec Marsh is young. These are all very positive things. MacArthur, there's a, a reliever for you. That That's the kind of vibe that this team has. And as much as you can joke about doing something fully on vibes, there is a positive element to that that can permeate throughout a clubhouse. Speaking of vibes, a player who I think has really good ones, Nelson Velasquez, always in a good mood, swings a big stick, can hit a lot of home runs. Um, This is from farmtofountains.com, which they do a lot of Royals prospect stuff, but they, they break down the big league club too. Talking about the probably unsustainable start to Nelson Velasquez's season. I would like to just read you this one paragraph. The reason the start is concerning is because even with this hot start, Nelly has been the definition of boom or bust swinging. So far on the year, he has whiffed at 42.6% of swings taken. Last year, he swung and missed a lot, and he was at 33.7%, almost 10 percentage points higher. There is a key reason. Of the pitches he has faced, three pitches have forced in over 66% whiff rate. 
curveballs, sweepers, and changeups. If we combine his average and slugging for all three pitches, he has a .00 average and a .00 slug. He has no hits all season so far on curveballs, sweepers, and changeups. Anything that spins. Anything that is slow. Fastball? Gone. See ya. A regular old slider. Easy. Chopped liver. You throw that sweeper out there, he's going to look like Babe Ruth would look against a modern-day pitcher, just spinning like a top into the dirt. I think it is extremely cool that he loves the movie Major League so much that he is doing a uh, tribute to Pedro Serrano. (laughs) I... Jesus Christ, I like him very much, but he no help with curveball. I do agree. Did Jesus Christ hit a sweeper? Probably. (laughs) Probably. Um, I do agree that it's probably unsustainable, but by the same token, I think we kind of know what Nelson Velasquez is. And if if you're going to just do nothing but throw curveballs and changeups to him and he still can't hit it as the year goes on, yeah, probably a concern, probably a worry. But if teams are going to throw him fastballs and, you know, he's going to hit him hard, he's going to hit him far. I like Nelson Velasquez a lot. I really do. But this does feel kind of Nick Prado first part of last season to me. Yeah, the the batting average on balls in play being 438 is not going to be real (laughs) sustainable. (laughs) Even that's 100 points lower than Prado was for a while. Yeah, he's got to get cut the swing and miss down. Um, he, He was never like. I'm trying to find his minor league swing and miss numbers, and I might not be able to, to be honest with you. Uh, It might be a futile futile pursuit, but it's really hard to strike out a bunch and be productive. Mm -hmm. It's really hard. We talked about it with Nick Prado last year, right? Uh, Somebody I happen to follow uh, on Twitter who is uh, embracing his role as like the number one Ellie Dela Cruz skeptic on on the internet, (laughs) which... I don't know why you want to be skeptical about that guy. He's super fun to watch, but yeah, he is. He strikes out a lot and he doesn't walk a lot. Mm-hmm. So it's hard to be productive when you don't do either of those things, unless you hit for a ton of power. So all just looking at the last, uh, let's say seven, eight seasons, players who struck out more than a third of the time walked less than 10% of the time, but were above average offensive players. According to weighted runs created plus you're talking about guys like Mike Zanino who was an all-star, but very mm-hmm. much boomer bust, mm-hmm. who's either hitting a home run, but he batted like 170 every year. Hey, Oscar Hernandez, who has been that kind of player in his career. Uh, Javier Baez in 2021. You saw what happened when he stopped making contact. Mm-hmm. Patrick Wisdom, your boy. Yeah. In 2022. Like, is, is he even in the major leagues anymore? Oh, uh, yeah, he is. Uh, Bobby Dahlbeck's another one, uh, former big time <laughs> Red Sox prospect. But like Bobby yeah. Dahlbeck did that in 2021. He's a fringe major leaguer now. Mm-hmm. Patrick Wisdom did that in 2022. He is a fringe major leaguer now. Javier Baez did that in 2021. He is a ski mask all star stealing from the Illich family mm-hmm. uh, with that big contract uh, in, in Detroit. So that's the point. It's really hard to be good and strike out that much and walk that little. What needs to happen is you have to have a ton of luck on batting average on balls in play, which Velasquez has, or you got to hit the ball over the fence a lot, which Velasquez has the potential to do. It would be a little bit of a bummer if his ceiling as a hitter were uh, like Teoscar Hernandez or Javier Baez in a good year. Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's not a player you can count on year over year, but the problem is pretty self-explanatory based on that stat, right? Like just lay off the spinny stuff, get yourself in good counts, get in fastball counts, and then you can do some damage. The easy comparison, and this would be the Royals comparison I would make, um, is, and well, this is before this player came to the Royals. Uh, this is young Jorge Soler. Okay. A lot of similarities. Sure. Through similar amounts of time in the major. I mean, Velasquez has only taken 444 plate appearances in his career. He's still really young, does not have a whole lot of major league experience. How old is he? He's only 25. Uh, he was born on Boxing Day in 98. He um, he hits a lot of home runs. He hits more home runs than young Soler did. Fewer other hits, though. Doesn't hit as many singles and doubles as younger Soler did. Jorge also walked a little bit more at the time. I mean, that's kind of the the profile, though, of a player. And Soler has become a better hitter over time and has gone on to hit a lot of home runs in his career. Mm -hmm. But 
that's sort of the player that I would compare him to, that he is going to be a boomer bust guy. He's going to strike out a lot, but you have to not swing and miss at quite so many pitches. If you hit a few more singles and doubles, that's a very useful player, especially if he's going to be hitting seventh for you, sixth or seventh in the lineup with that kind of power. You can live with that, especially because you won't be able to pitch around him all that much if other guys in front and behind him are getting on base and are hitting for a high average and are getting on plenty. Well, here's the thing that Solaire did that he didn't really do as a young player, but that he did improve over time is he walked more and he made more contact. Mm -hmm. His strikeout numbers, uh, his walk numbers got up above 10, 11%. And his strikeout numbers, except for the COVID year where he struck out 34.5% of the time, Mm -hmm. uh, the year before that, when he when he set the Royals record for single season home runs, he only struck out 26% of the time. And over the last little while, he's been, his career uh, number is right around that 26%, 26.6% strikeout. If Velasquez can get his number there, then he's going to, that means he'll get to the power more often. That's what it is. You can have all the power in the world. Power's great. Raw power, love it. If you're not making contact, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. So the question for Velasquez is, how do you get to that power? How do you make more contact? And yeah, sometimes it's going to be leaving those breaking pitches in the dirt, leaving those changeups out of the zone, leaving those pitches alone. Because until he proves he can, he's going to be seeing nothing but. We've got some college basketball and some wild numbers from the transfer portal to get to after this commercial break here on 5 Sports Talk. Talks more college basketball coming up in the four o'clock hour today with Michael Swain. We'll have Jayhawk Weekly bottom of the four. A little more heat behind the rumors and a little more smoke behind the rumors of Rylan Griffin maybe committing to KU soon. Zeke Mayo posted on his uh, Snapchat story a picture of 
uh, Rylan Griffin guarding him in a game between Alabama and South Dakota State this past year hmm. with the eyeball emojis. Hmm. You know what that means. You know the eyeball emojis out there. Yeah. We're cooking something up, bringing something out there. I like how that becomes public, like his Snapchat story has become public. Yeah. Hey, when- not an Instagram story. A Snapchat story. I didn't know people still use Snap. I use Snapchat for like the same three people I talk to on it or send pictures to. I do not know anyone who still uses Snapchat stories. Apparently, Zeke Mayo. Uh, I mean, it's still a big thing. Is it? Yeah. For your generation, Man, maybe. Cooking me over here. I know. This is weird. So I know a bunch of like people between your age range that use it. So I'm confused. I mean, I, I use Snapchat. I have two notifications right now. But I don't use the stories. I just use, if I was going to post one, I'd put it on Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. I have one friend, though. I, my three best friends and I, three people have iPhones. One has an Android. My okay. one iPhone yeah. friend is so adamant he will not have a text thread, like a group message with green bubbles. We instead have a Snapchat group message. Yeah. That is our group text. <laughs> he is adamant he will not use a green bubble group text. That's so petty. I have to respect it. <laughs> yeah. It can, I mean, it works. It's just strange. So we tell my buddy, get it, just get an iPhone so <laughs> we can move to a regular text thread. I saw this this week from Evan Miyakawa. This was actually from Friday, as of Friday. So the numbers have changed a little bit. We have the two Texas players who entered the portal yesterday, Dylan Mitchell and Tyrese Hunter, and a handful of other guys around college basketball too. But he had the percentage of players and the percentage of minutes from every conference that have entered the transfer portal this year. These numbers are crazy. The Big 12, for what it's worth, of the 32 Division I conferences, fifth fewest number of players who have entered the portal this year. Um, and it is the fourth fewest in terms of number of minutes played so far this year, which is pretty impressive. I mean, that's it's the Big 12. That's a destination conference. You want to be in the Big 12. You probably don't want to leave or you transfer in conference. Uh, that's different than, say, the Patriot League, which is the least poached or the least exited conference so far. But that's probably more so because, like, there's nowhere to go lower <laughs> unless you're going to the Northeast Conference. Like, that. That's yeah, about as low D1 as you're going to get. Who's lining up for Lehigh's stars? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think there's a whole lot of Bucknell interest in the portal this year. The flip side of that is the Southland. 40%, 40.1% of their players are in the portal. 63. 63 as well from the Metro Atlantic. Meanwhile, the Valley, 44.3% of minutes played. I think of their all-conference teams. Uh, they had 16 guys make all conference. Uh, so there was one tie. Okay. So you have five man, five man first team all conference, five man second team, and then the third team I think was six guys. Okay. One of those guys is coming back next year, and it's not because they were all see, uh, grad transfers. Like I, I think I, I'm trying to remember how many of them had eligibility. I want to find that stat so I can. That's crazy. But uh, yeah, the that league has been decimated by the portal and some of that is like okay tucker devries doesn't come back to drake because his dad got a new job yeah and a lot of those drake guys yeah, left. Iowa, yeah iowa state's coach got a new job here it is yeah uh 12 of the top 15 it was 12 of the top 15 players in the valley had wow. eligibility and one of them is coming back crazy bradley guard duke dean but yeah you're right i mean you lose indiana state's head coach mm -hmm. josh shirts you lose uh darren devries at drake you have the change at Missouri State mm -hmm. as well. So you're bringing a lot more players in. It's not like suddenly you don't have those spots anymore and you're going to bring in good talent. I mean, Quanzo Martin, of all the things Quanzo Martin can't do at a coach, he can't, as a coach, he can get commits. He can recruit really well. This guy's going to go play for Quanzo Martin. I think Ben McCollum is going to get plenty of talent at Drake. Hell, he's taking uh, his, his point guard, Bennett Sturts, from Northwest. He announced today he's transferring to Drake. Bye. See, see ya. <laughs> uh, best of luck to you. Glad, uh, glad you're not going to be making the trip to Lee Arena this year. He, he's a heck of a player. But I just thought these numbers were crazy. And like I mentioned earlier, this is the way that I can better understand and comprehend the number of players who are going portaling. Spencer and I were talking about this 
uh, this morning that it is a like, it's a good thing for, for me. Yeah, I, I think the the portal is a really good thing, but it is kind of crazy. Like TJ Bamba today, who really good player at one point, highly touted transfer to Villanova. I don't remember where he had been before, but he transferred into Villanova this past year. Highly touted, good player, really skilled athlete. Transferring out after one year. And I know that Kyle Neptune stinks. He was at Washington State. Washington State. Thank you. That's why I, I should have known. D- Kyle Neptune stinks. He's a bad head coach at Villanova. Seems like it. But it wasn't that long ago. Villanova was a, oh, man, if you made it there, you made it kind of program. Like, why would you leave? You got to transfer in once. Why Why would you ever leave? But now there's, there's all sorts of reasons to leave any given program. Now, guys are going to leave KU probably this year. Guys leave the, all over the place. It's. I can understand the one gripe. The one gripe I can understand about the transfer portal is it's just so hard year to year to keep up with who's on the roster. And I like to see guys develop from, you know, unheralded freshmen to key contributor as a senior. As a fan, I really do understand that. I I get it. I think it's an overwhelming good thing for college basketball and for college sports in general. But I mean, it is a lot of change. The, there are not going to be, in my estimation, many more Dewan Harris's and KJ Adams. That those guys are going to be fewer and farther between going forward. I suspect that's probably true, mm-hmm. and I don't think that's necessarily great for college basketball mm-hmm. as a whole. But uh, I, I do. That's it, it's just broadly fascinating to see, like the ACC of the power conferences has the most departures. Mm-hmm. And the SEC has the fewest. I thought that was an interesting note as well. Well, that is interesting. A lot of ACC departures, a lot of American departures. And that kind of makes sense because the American is like the next step below Mm -hmm. the power structure. So you probably got a lot of players thinking, hey, you know, I can move up. Yeah. Or Or, you you have some players who get there and say, hey, maybe this isn't for me. Or you are Bobby Pettiford, who we thought was going to be a stud at East Carolina who has now for the second year in a row transferred down and he committed to high point the other day. Hmm. Like that's kind of the middle ground of either. I think I can go higher or, Oh shoot. This is still too close to the top. (laughs) I actually still need to go lower coming up in the three o'clock hour of five eighty sports talk. We'll lead things off with maybe a little more reason why we should believe in the Royals this year. Plus random question Tuesday and more college or for NFL coming up here on five eighty sports talk.
three o'clock hour of 580 Sports Talk going up on a Tuesday. Brendan Dworzinski and Dan Lucero and Spencer Dupuy here with you today. Thanks for spending some of your afternoon hours with us. We'll get to some NFL later on, NFL draft. We are now nine days away from the first round of the draft. It is getting closer and closer. Random question Tuesday coming up. Some more Royals baseball as well here in just a few moments. We'd love for you to be a part of the show. And we'd love to hear from you on the Top City Metal Supply text line, 785-272-9429. No more wasted money or wasted materials because Top City Metal Supply will cut the exact lengths of steel, stainless steel, and aluminum that you and your specific project need. So check them out here in Topeka on South Topeka Boulevard, just north of Forbes Field. You can also find us, subscribe to us, and watch us on YouTube. 580 Sports Talk is the name of our YouTube channel. It's time for your three o'clock hour. Choose your trip 2024 keyword. Head to 580wibw.com. Go click on choose your trip 2024 and enter this keyword from now until four o'clock. It is only active for this hour. So if you want to be entered, put in the keyword town. T-O-W-N. Town. Again, that's at 580wibw.com to enter for the Choose Your Trip contest from Alpha Media. There was a blog from Dan Zimborski of Fangraphs that went up yesterday, and I saw this and I thought, oh, man, I bet you Dan had Google alerts for this. I bet Dan <laughs> pulled this up right away. I don't even remember. You just have beefed on Twitter before. Yes. Is that the problem? Yes, we have. Okay. Yes. I. What's new? I feel like. Dan beefs with a lot of people on Twitter, <laughs> including all of Iowa State fans. Hey, you know what? Iowa State fans, <laughs> Smash Mouth, Dan Zimborski from Fangraphs. And it covers all the bases, right? Probably uh, some more. Ben we, Albright. Yes. Probably more we don't know about. Ben Albright, definitely him. Yeah. Um, Took a quick break from cheating on his wife to yell at you on Twitter one time. Yes. Um. So it was... Zimborski's insistence that the Royals should have torn it down after the 2015 World Series and traded all their guys with two years of team control left and not tried to contend in 2016 and 2017 and tr like traded Lorenzo Kane, traded Eric Hosmer, traded Mike Moustakis to get peak value for them because then they wouldn't have been so bad in 2018 and 2019. And I said... That would have been absolute insanity, a terrible business decision. Real life is not out of the park baseball. Get a clue, <laughs> I chart man, essentially. And uh, I was mean about it because a younger me used to be a little bit more mean. On uh, A lot of the, the dealings we're describing here with me beefing with like Smash Mouth, well, three years ago, I'm older and more uh, mature now. I don't do these things as <laughs> often as I used to. So an older me probably would not have made it personal with Dan Zimborski, who has done a lot of great work in the sabermetric space. I happen to heartily disagree with him about his thoughts on what the Royals should have done after winning a championship. But I have, I wish the man no ill and uh, I, I want him dead. <laughs> probably should unblock him on Twitter. <laughs> That's funny. You haven't blocked. I, I I blocked him. Like who the hell am I? Right? Yeah. I blocked him. Did he block you back? That's the sign of disrespect. If no. someone blocks you back. No. I I I did not rate a block back. I did that to uh, to Jayhawks land. They blocked me, so I blocked him back. <laughs> I have no problem talking bad about that. There's a reason we have our pal Michael Swain join us instead of someone from that website. Anyway, that's oh, wow. beside the point. Uh, yeah. Well, we can talk about that another time. So Simborski puts up this piece the other day, I guess it was yesterday afternoon, about the Royals, and it's titled, Can the Royals Pull Off an AL Central Upset? It says, believe it or not, we're almost 10% of the way through the 2024 season, and while baseball always offers myriad surprises, especially this early, one of the ones that most intrigues me is the success of the Kansas City Royals. And then later on says that only one member of the Fangraphs team actually picked the Royals to win the Central, while playoffs odds, playoff odds at Fangraphs gave them a 1 in 14 chance of winning the division, the Zips metric for predictions and projections gave them a 5.9% chance prior to opening day 
of winning the American League Central. Right now, as it stands, those odds have rocketed up to 17.9%. That is only about 2.7% lower than the chance given to the uh, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm misreading this here. That's to get to a wild card. 16.4% to win the division. Nearly 18% to make it to a wild card. Overall, 34.3% chance to make the playoffs. 34% chance for a team that at the start of the year was given a 1 in 14 chance or 7.1%. That is how much they have improved their playoff odds through the first now 17 games of the regular season. No other team in baseball has seen their playoff odds, according to this metric, rise as much as the Royals have. For what it's worth, your next four, to complete the top five, the Yankees, Pirates, Brewers, and Guardians, in order, the Yankees were already given a 59% chance to make the playoffs, the Guardians at 55. So the Royals, from the very basement, have taken a big leap in that regard. And he points out, the specific guys who are just crushing the ball right now, like Bobby Witt Jr., who he says he may have somehow found yet another gear. And Bobby got a little bit unlucky yesterday, had another offer. He also, his final at bat of the day, did you see his exit velocity on his final out that he made in the game? I did not. 104.7. He hit the ball almost 105 miles an hour off the bat. Wow. Like and Like a radio station. And it was out. Yeah. Yeah. Classic hits, 104.7. <laughs> yeah. That's what Bobby Witt Jr. hit off the bat. His final time up yesterday, it turned into an out. Sometimes that just happens. Hasn't been the greatest last four games for Witt. He's a superstar. I'm not worried at all about him. Points out MJ Melendez, who maybe isn't projected to be quite as good according to the Zips projections. Again, that's a fan graphs thing. Still showing some positives, and they like him a little bit better than they have in the past. There are other guys who have made moderate gains. You look at guys who have been with the team already, like a Michael Garcia, like the early okay-ish start for Nick Lofton. Seth Lugo and Michael Waka have been more impressive than I, than I expected, to be frank, specifically when it comes to Michael Waka. Adam Frazier has been fine so far. Then go and get to the other superstar. Go take a look at Cole Reagans yeah. and the fact that he has been this good. He has been great. That is not news to us. That is not news to you. But Cole Reagans has been awesome. That is another awesome, awesome sign for this team. He is allowing a 68.6% contact rate to get guys aren't touching his stuff, which is great for this team. So that leads me to then wondering as much as I still stick with what I have already told you that I am going to refrain from making any sort of strong decisions about how I feel about this team, this Royals team until middle of next month, when we hit that quarter pole of the season, when we have enough of a sample size to be able to make some more conclusive, you know, conclusions, I guess, some more decisive conclusions about this Royals team to really determine if I think, yeah, they're going to make a playoff push or not. But I think it is fair to say at this point, it's fair to believe if you are so inclined to that this can be a playoff team this year. Maybe you don't think for sure they will be, but if you were to tell me, no, I believe this team can be it. I went into the year pessimistic. I'm a little more optimistic now. I believe this is this is the bones of, the structure of, the foundation of what can be a playoff team. I think it's okay to think that right now. At the very least, this is not a fluky stretch. This is not a stretch of play where the Royals have a record that is a bit of a fluke. Right now, as of today, going into today's game, they have the best run differential in baseball. They are plus 39 in run differential. That is best in baseball. If you are scoring more runs than your opponent over a 17-game stretch, better than anyone else in the league, that means you're good value for your record. So we're not looking at an 11 and six record that feels like a mirage because mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're winning some squeakers, but every game that they're not winning, they're getting blown out quite the opposite. As we've discussed. Shoot. According to uh, the old Pythag win loss formula, 
They're actually underperforming based on yeah. their run differential. That says they should be 13 and four at this point. So that is how well the Royals are playing. It is not a mistake. It is not an accident that they have compiled this record. It is not a stroke of good luck that is sure to be soon extinguished. They are playing as well as their record says they are playing. So then the question becomes, they're capable of this for 17 games in April. Are they capable of it for 162? That's the bigger question. It goes back to what my concern was when we started this season is depth. What happens if the injury bug bites? What happens when you're going to have to have some reserves in your pitching staff? Mm -hmm. When it's your sixth starter or your 10th reliever that has to pitch some high leverage innings? Can the Royals get good work from the bottom of their 40-man roster? Because every team is going to need that at some point. For the Royals' sake, I hope they need it less. I hope that the innings that whoever starters number six through eight are going to have to cover for the Royals are not Cole Reagan's innings, are not Brady Singer innings. Mm -hmm. That uh, that these are, and I don't wish anybody getting injured, but you hope that it's not the high value guys that are the ones who are missing extended time. The Royals can keep their elite guys healthy, Reagan's and Witt in particular. Then. I think they'll be in pretty good shape. Like I, I think that this is a team that has proven emphatically, like we talked about at the top of the show, they have proven emphatically that they are not one of the worst teams in baseball because we've seen them play against one of the worst teams in baseball and they're kicking the hell out of them. I am just envisioning the picture of George W. Bush on an aircraft carrier with mission accomplished behind him, <laughs> yeah. as you say that. Not one of the worst teams in baseball. Yes, yeah. The, schedule the parade. Hang the banner. <laughs> Better I, than last year when they were. Right! That's what... Like, how much is it reasonable to expect to improve from a 56-win season? Well, when you overhaul almost the entire roster... When you only bring seven guys or your 26-man roster back, then maybe it is reasonable to say, hey, they can improve by 20 wins, maybe even more than 20 wins. Because that's a big ask normally to say, we're going to go from 56 wins to uh, to 76 wins. Mm -hmm. That would be a huge leap. If that's where the Royals ended up this season, I'd still consider this season a success, a sign of growth, a positive indicator for the future. But... The ability to do more than that, I do think, exists because of the division that they play in. I know Detroit's off to a good start. Cleveland has the second-best run differential in baseball presently. They're playing some good ball. Cleveland! They've also lost their ace for the season already. That's tough. So, yeah. you know, they, they're they already dealing with the injuries that inevitably have an effect over the course of 162. So, yeah, your biggest reason for optimism there are twofold for me. Number one, they are playing exactly as good and maybe even better than their record would indicate that they are through 17 games. So this is what they are capable of over a stretch. And number two, they're in a division that should allow for, I mean, they get eight more games against the White Sox. That's pretty good. Yeah, I'll take that. <laughs> they, got a, they got eight more games against these clowns. So uh, that, really, that want, really want to go back to the unbalanced schedule this year. Yeah, I would love to play them 19 times. Yeah, that would be really, really nice. I can't think of Cleveland without thinking of the hastily made Cleveland tourism videos. I can't do it. Come on down to Cleveland Town, everyone. Have you seen those? No. Uh, Under sure. construction since 1868. I literally watched them earlier today. I was watching old YouTube videos that I find hilarious still to this day. Our economy's based on LeBron James. Buy a house for the price of a VCR. This train is carrying jobs out of Cleveland. <laughs> Play the audio. <laughs> I have a couple of questionable words in there, but oh my yeah, God, we, those we, are funny. We couldn't play them all the way through. Got to bleep uh, them out. We've got a question from the Top City Metal Supply text line regarding one of the uh, Bring it on. pleasant starts uh, to this season from the 785. Want to get your guys' thoughts on MJ Melendez, specifically as a fielder. He's made some decent plays in left field thus far. How much improved do you think that he is from last year? I think markedly, to be honest with, and granted, my perception of MJ was lower than most, and I think his value had already dropped quite a bit. I mean, I, I was hard on the guy. I've already said that a bit this year, but I've been impressed. We knew coming in, both him and Vinny, when they were coming up with the big club, 
We talked on this program about how they brought a more professional approach to the plate than a lot of other Royals position players over the last several years. And they just brought, you know, they would take a pitch or two. They would wait for a better pitch as opposed to just swinging at everything. And sometimes that works. Sometimes you're Salvador Perez and you're a borderline Hall of Famer when you swing at everything. Sometimes, and most of the time for other Royals, it doesn't work out quite that way. But they brought that sort of professional approach to the plate. And I think MJ was struggling with that a bit more last year, had hit the sophomore wall a little bit. I have been very impressed by what he has been able to do this year. I think he's taken a lot of strides forward. And at least for me, in the field, I don't think he's ever going to be like, I, good don't, in the field. Don't expect Alex Gordon, right? Like Royals fans have been spoiled mm-hmm. with gold glove caliber defense in left field for the better part of the last decade plus with Alex Gordon winning seven gold gloves. Andrew Benintendi won a gold glove mm-hmm. too out there in left field in his brief time as a Royal. But, but I, I will say just real quick, in his first two seasons with the Royals, using defensive runs saved, and you can judge defense in in any number of ways, but based on defensive runs saved through his first two seasons, MJ Melendez was a minus 19 in that category, which is not bad. It is horrific. I mean, that is like unplayably bad. This year, so far, small sample, plus three. That's... I don't know that it's going to stay that way. But again, you if he's going to swing a decent bat with some pop, you just need him to be okay. Yeah. Even if he's a C-minus defender, you can live with that because he's bringing other value to the table. So looking at some of the nerd numbers here, his fielding run value last year uh, as an outfielder was minus eight. He was worth minus eight runs as a defensive outfielder. Mm-hmm. So far this year, he has been worth one run in the positive direction Uh, outs above average last year, minus 11 in the outfield so far this year, minus one Uh, another number of note. They uh, stat cast keeps stats on your jump, the jump that you get as an outfielder. And uh, while Melendez's reactions are not great, his routes appear to be improving. They actually keep a route score and so far, MJ Melendez's routes are some of the best in baseball. Mm-hmm. That tracks, right? Because we're talking about an athlete here. The, yes. the reason that he was moved from behind the plate to the outfield is because the Royals thought he could do it. And because Salvador Perez is the catcher, right? Like that, mm-hmm. that, that that's maybe the biggest reason. Maybe that what doesn't happen if Salvador Perez isn't in the organization. But they thought that Melendez could handle this. And what I think he's benefiting from is only playing left field, not switching him from left field to right field. And oh yeah, you're gonna catch some time mm-hmm. moving him around the diamond the way they did his rookie year. I, I don't think Mike Matheny did him any favors doing that. Then last year he switched between left Mike field. Mike Matheny did damage to a young player. Yeah, weird, right? <laughs> I Holy cow. I'm floored. Unbelievable. Stop <laughs> the presses. Now, last year, he flipped between left field and right field quite a bit. They were trying to find the right fit for him. And this year, they have settled him into left field. And I think it's natural that the more you play one spot, the more comfortable you get, the more you are then able to use your own natural athletic ability. So I think the defense for Melendez is trending in a good direction. I'm never going to expect it to be gold glove caliber, but I do think he's finding his way out there and looks to me to be a playable major league left fielder. That is not something I would have said about him last year. I would have said maybe they should let him use a laundry basket instead of a glove to try and catch the baseball. (laughs) But this year, the metrics are kinder. The eye test is kinder. It really does look like he's figuring it out out there. For what it's worth, I think Mike Matheny was not quite as much of a hard ass toward younger players when he was in Kansas City as he was in St. Louis. That doesn't mean he was a good manager for young players. Wasn't exactly Joe Madden taking care of his youngsters, but I I don't think it was quite as bad as when he was actively bullying Cardinals his final years when he was in St. Louis. Coming up next, we've got today's Random Question Tuesday, and then later on this hour, a look into the quarterbacks who are available in this year's NFL Draft. Coming up here on 5 Sports Talk.
random question Tuesday time with Brendan, Dan, and Spencer here on 580 Sports Talk on this Tuesday, April 16th. Real quick, want to say uh, happy anniversary to my wife. It's our second hey, wedding anniversary. Happy there you anniversary go. to the Drusinskis. Yeah. You were there. Yes, I was. Yeah. For the party. Party of the year. Yeah, I was there for Club Drusinski. Yeah. We, yeah. We, were, we were turning up. <laughs> You were not there, but I didn't know you were. I didn't know you existed yeah, at the time. I didn't so, know you guys existed. Yeah. Well, any plans for tonight? Um, no. We actually, my wife's got a. She's taking a business trip the rest of the week, so she's got to get up early tomorrow. So we did our anniversary dinner Friday night instead. Uh, there um, you go. Went out and got steak. Yeah, it was, it was very good. Um, so yeah, we're just we're just chilling at home, hanging out tonight. But uh, yeah, wanted to wish my my lovely wife a happy anniversary. All right, random question Tuesday time. Spencer, you're up first because you told us yesterday you've been sitting on this one for a while. Yeah, because we uh, kind of ran out of time last Tuesday before yes. my random question, or I forgot that I had it. It was one or the other. <laughs> I like write it, it down, but then like I write other things down, so then it lose my I put it to pin it to the top of my notepad. There we go. When I found it at the end of last there week. There we go. What was your favorite popular thing? from when you were growing up slash a kid is in like everyone had this, whatever it was like the fad or. The, yeah. Okay. Do you want me to start with mine or end with mine? Sure. You yeah. Start yeah. With yours tech decks. Oh the yeah. Skateboard? Oh yeah. yeah. Or one, a one B would be a Tamagotchi. Interesting. I never had one. I never had one of those either. Uh, or silly bands that those were just, after, so okay, it makes sense here. Those were just after me when we those always really had blew the sports up. ones. Yeah, and uh, like then teams came out with theirs. Yeah. yeah, I I don't know what those are, guys. They were okay. Remember the the Livestrong bracelet phase? Yeah, sure. These were thinner. Wait, like you pull them too hard, they would snap easily. Yeah, it's like a but rubber band. The the band itself was shaped like something. How silly! Like footballs or cats, cats yeah, or stuff rhinos like that. or yeah. you know whatever. Okay, yeah, those, those were huge for those tech decks. Tech. Were you a boarder, Spencer? No, I wasn't. I I just like tech just decks. Like it's a little fidgety yeah. kind of thing. You yeah, know? if you, if you no, don't I, know, I that. That you you literally would skateboard with two fingers and do tricks and stuff. They got banned when I was in junior high. They, I, <laughs> everyone had them. I found mine uh, when I was cleaning out <laughs> stuff from my room after my parents had moved. They're like. Hey, this was all in your room. Like, clean it out. Do something after with I it. After I graduated yeah. from college, and I was like, "Oh my gosh, it's a tech deck." <laughs> That's really funny. That's a good one. Um, man, I'm sure I have plenty. Um, it wasn't a thing I had, but like I think of websites that no one visits anymore that I used to visit all the time. Like, did you ever go to HomestarRunner.com? <laughs> I know. Yeah, that that one stands out to me 100. I don't know if anyone still goes to homestarrunner.com. But did I you could, ever I could probably play... still sing the Trogdor song. Oh, I definitely could. Trogdor, I know every word. Trogdor the Burninator. Yeah. All the songs they did. Did I you could... ever play Fun Brain when you were a kid? Oh, you yeah. in that era? Yeah, that was Do you was remember the... like the the Hummer one or whatever it was? The the like the game that everyone played. I don't know if I do. Mighty, gu Mighty guys. Yeah, we there Mighty were, guys. like three websites that weren't blocked at our school that had games you could play. So, yeah, we, we never, played a lot of those. Never heard of that. I'm starting to feel old. You guys are making me feel old in this segment. Guy. I don't know how much I appreciate it. What's this. your answer? Um, You know, like when I think of stuff that was really popular when I was a kid, um, like it was popular to collect baseball cards and stuff like that. So that's what I collected <laughs> and put them in your spokes and buy <laughs> cigarettes and get a card out of them. All right, guys. All right. All right. Um, I'm giving you a hard time. Yeah. <laughs> pogs. <laughs> what you know about pogs? They're little discs, right? Yes. Yeah. Very stupid fad. You just <laughs> collected them and then like you like, threw a, a, a thick pog onto all the skinny pogs in a stack and if they ended up heads up you got to keep them yeah whatever i have no it was. clue what that is yeah i i never remember i love the difference in our age remember like it works elf, out he's back in pog form i do i i know elf yeah we're ready for the we're ready for the pog comeback for sure are we p-o-g <laughs> yeah yes that's a not p-a-w-g that's a very different thing that you shouldn't google at work <laughs> yeah on, on your own. Disconnect from the work internet before you Google that one. Um, yeah, Pogs were a little... All right, I can't. We're, we're done with Pogs. We can't do this anymore. Yeah. All right, mine for today. What are you putting off right now? 
<laughs> oh. <laughs> well, if it was uh, me last week, I would have said uh, my taxes. <laughs> taxes. <laughs> uh, also, until today, until yesterday, I was putting off registering your car, car registration. <laughs> yeah. But now the thing that I'm putting off is trying to find car insurance that's cheap enough. I would recommend not waiting too long on that oh, I personally, but I, I get it. I get it. What about? What am I putting off that I can talk about? Um, yeah. <laughs> what am I putting off? Uh, probably mowing the lawn. Probably about time for that first mow. Yeah. Uh, of the year. Me too. And, uh, yeah, I'm 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 uh, big time procrastinating on that. We got our mower. We just bought a mower this weekend. But then, I, I mean, it's pretty simple assembly, I think. But then I was calling Washburn Baseball on Saturday. That ate up a lot of my afternoon. Then Sunday, did Washburn Baseball again. And then it was windy. And I said, eh, I'll, I'll wait. Not Now our lawn is getting kind of overgrown. The reason this question came up is I went to the eye doctor today. Mm -hmm. Shout out to Dr. Trumbull, by the way. I went Great to the eye guy. doctor Monday. I need to go that? to an eye doctor here. There you go. Also and get new glasses because I broke mine in the middle of the night a couple weeks ago. Not to brag, I was told today that almost anyone with a pulse would kill for my eyes, but that's fine. Not to brag. Um, but I famously was told in 2010 when I got diagnosed with diabetes, I needed to go to an eye doctor as soon as I possibly could. And then the first time I ever went to an eye doctor was not until 2021, <laughs> which was probably not great. But eyes are good. Eyes are fine. No, no glaucoma or anything. So shout out to Dr. Trumbull. What's something you've been craving food-wise that you haven't had in a while? Oh, food-wise. Oh, I can tell you because I ate two of them on Sunday afternoon. Hot dogs. I had not had a freaking hot dog in so long. Because my wife doesn't eat them. And I always feel bad being like, oh, yeah, buy all sorts of stuff that you don't eat that I eat. And I hadn't even thought about them for a while. I said, damn, babe, I, just, I want some hot dogs. Just when you go to the store this week, hot dogs, please. Oh, my God. Like eating a slice of heaven. It's so good. <laughs> I love hot dogs. My wife was craving bratwurst on the weekend. Oh, so God, we, that's so Yeah, good. went and bought and gr got the grill out. Got the grill out for the first time yeah. and threw some brats on the grill. That was, uh, that was a fabulous choice. <sighs> Mine is awesome. a restaurant that's in the D.C. area. It's Lido Pizza. Okay. Just they make these really, really good strombolis. Hmm strombolis it's like a calzone yeah like we calzone. yeah well i grew up with a place not connected at all but it was lido's pizza spelled the same way just possessive yeah, lido pizza is like a uh, it's a university of maryland kind of thing okay and then it kind of is, has gone like spread out a little bit yes i know lido's pizza of countryside illinois greasiest pizza i've ever had in my life so good though oh so good they had an arcade inside the, a lot of Pac-Man. The other thing uh, that my wife had been craving was root beer floats. So we bought some root beer and vanilla ice cream, and we've had root beer floats through the last three nights. And let me tell you, they go crazy. I'm also craving cookout. Oh, buddy. Again, can't help you. I would hammer <laughs> some cookout right now. When uh, I was moving out here, we stopped by my college. There's one in there. And yeah. we drove by it, and we had literally just eaten oh. with one of my friends. And I was like, no. <laughs> And then we left too early for it to be open. To be open. Oh, brutal. $7 for 8,000 calories. And that's not even much of an exaggeration. The best after a night out. Do you put? Do you make other kinds of floats ever? No. Like a Coke float? Coke float. We, I had those grown up. We could, yes. But uh, no, we go, with the, uh, we go with the root beer float. Little A&W root beer. Vanilla ice cream. Just the traditional float. Yeah. Hey, they go they go so crazy like it, it, never regret having a root beer float i used to make back in my my fast food worker days i used to make root beer floats for people all the time although we didn't have just plain vanilla like regular scoop ice cream so it was soft serve in mm -hmm. a root beer float i i could go for soft serve ice cream right now too i love soft serve ice cream it's it like that can't be good for you like whatever chemical is in it like it, <laughs> it can't be good for you but god it's delicious coming up next the nfl draft begins in just nine days how much will this year's quarterback class impact the nfl in 2024 we'll break it down after this on 580 sports talk
The NFL draft begins on April 25th, nine days away, a week from Thursday, 7 p.m. start time, I believe. The quarterbacks are, per usual, the dominant storyline for this year's draft. And there is a chance, maybe not a great chance, but a chance they go QB one through four this year. Caleb Williams, Jaden Daniels, Drake May, J.J. McCarthy, in some order, it is possible they go one through four. It would be I, the first time ever. I feel like we're at like a, a more of a chance for one through three. Well, one through three for sure. For oh, sure. Yeah. The fourth is kind of a wild card. Yeah, because Arizona, which has the fourth pick, they have so many needs for good players. Could you trade back and you know get a future second and just pick a few spots later this year? Sure. Or just take Marvin Harrison and get a wide receiver that you desperately need. So that that one's definitely the intriguing spot there. I would kind of, uh, you know, people who do this for a living, they will break it down. Here's your first round, no doubt grades, and your round one or two, and they break it down into eight different tiers. I've got three tiers for you. I've got the guys who appear locked into the first round. That's Caleb Williams, for sure. He's going number one overall. Jaden Daniels or Drake May, one will go second, one will go third, and then J.J. McCarthy. Those guys all appear to be locked in first round, probably top 10 at this point, unless McCarthy slips like Will Levis did last year, but I still think he'll go first round. What are the odds? Do you know if there are odds that those are the top four picks? Like, you probably bet that somewhere. Oh, I'm sure you could. The quarterbacks are the top four in some order. Yeah, you might. mm, I'm sure you can find that in an American book. You definitely can overseas, too, in an offshore book, but... Uh, I would imagine one of the the sports books has that. I'm going to check. My next tier is the guys who you could argue could be first rounders. I'd probably say they're day two guys, but you can see why someone would fall in love with them. That's Michael Penix and Bo Nix. And then there's everyone else, which is mid round flyer, late round flyer, Spencer Rattler, who some people really like Mina Kimes. I know has said she really likes Spencer Rattler among other people, Sam Hartman, who is, I could see Sam Hartman being a backup for eight years. I I could realistically seeing that, then becoming a G5 quarterbacks coach. Joe Milton, who someone will draft. Someone will draft Joe Milton because he can throw the ball 80 yards. He can throw it so far. And then... Does he know know where it's going? Like, how to hit a wide receiver in stride? Perhaps not, but unbelievable arm. And then after that, it's like Michael Pratt. Maybe I wouldn't be surprised if he gets taken late. Jordan Travis, if someone wants to take a flyer on you know, him as a backup when his leg gets fully healed. So those are your quarterbacks who are likely getting drafted this year with maybe one or two exceptions. Travis has been working out. Yeah. A video of him, he's he's back to working out. I, I think he'll definitely get taken. So I have a, a very similar question, but from two different perspectives. One kind of angled from the teams, one kind of angled from the quarterbacks. So for the quarterbacks, of all those guys I just mentioned, which I think in total is... 11 of them how many can make an immediate positive impact for a new team whoever that new team is as a rookie and I don't just mean they start for 12 plus games and oh, they're not bad but like actually oh no this was good like we, we took a step forward because we had this guy in there how many of these guys can do that Caleb Williams can yes I'm agreed I'm buying all the Caleb Williams stock. Like, if you want to sell, I'll, I'll buy it from you. Like, mm-hmm. I, I am all the way in on him being a dude right from Jump Street. And, I mean, I know it's the Bears. They've had not very good luck with quarterbacks historically. And I don't know how much of Justin Fields' failures there are strictly Justin Fields' problems or if they were problems with the offenses uh, that that he was put in. But if Caleb Williams gets a head coach and offensive coordinator with even the slightest clue, which I do not think Lincoln Riley really had last year, Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's going to be awesome right from the word go. I I, I think he's going to be – he'll he'll have a big impact on bringing the Bears back to respectability. And he's it. He's the only one that I would feel very comfortable saying for certain, I think will be a positive contributor day one, because some of the, some of this is about like who's drafting, Mm -hmm. right? Like, do do I really believe that Washington, I mean, I know they're trying to be different. I know Mm -hmm. that they're trying to come out of the Dan Snyder dark ages, but 
they've been what they've been for so long for a reason. Am I supposed to believe that whoever, whichever quarterback you want to see take, it first? Yes. Yeah, I, I, I get that. I need proof of concept with the new and improved Manders. Mm -hmm. Like, right? I get that. And thank you for not calling them the commies. <laughs> I like Manders because like, it's so stupid. It's more fun to say. Yes, yeah. it's, it's very stupid, but I love it so much. Um, Drake May is the same kind of deal. Like, where wherever he ends up, can you limit his – he's got some wild boy tendencies mm -hmm. to him. Yeah, he does. A little bit. And I, I don't mean like – I mean on the field, like some – screw it. Somebody's open down there somewhere, and I got to get enough mm -hmm. arm to get it to him. Sort of uh, – how, how do you temper that? Use that for good? Like, because that's not necessarily a negative trait. Like, mm -hmm. Mahomes had a little bit of that coming into the league. Yeah. And found a coach in an offensive system that got the best out of him, obviously. Uh, is that team going to be the one that drafts Drake May? Is Gerard Mayo and the new regime in New England the right place? Mm -hmm. Is Washington the right place if they decide they like him? And then J.J. McCarthy, to me, could be anything. Uh, honest to goodness. Yeah. He's the one I'm least likely to make a bet on either way. Like, if you said, okay, give me... It was like prize picks, like good or bad. Pick one to see which one you're going to be, which ones would be good. I like, I, I don't know. I'm not sold on Jaden Daniels at all. I have a lot of worries about him. I like Drake May. I like Caleb Williams. I, I would make a wager good or bad for any of them. McCarthy, I wouldn't touch. I have no idea. I want JJ McCarthy to be good unless he goes to Minnesota. I want him to be good because we come from the same hometown, but I do I have no idea. I, I really do not know what he is going to be. I think for me, Caleb is a no doubter. I I hate that he's going to be a bear because I think he's going to be really, really good. I am in on Drake May. I think there's a very realistic scenario this year where May maybe isn't great, where but you see enough. You know, if you're if he goes third, for example, he goes to New England, which a lot of people believe. I think there's still a chance to go second, but let's say he ends up going third to New England. And you see enough in him where you go, yes, there were growing pains. He has to work out some of the kinks from kind of a messy offense's final year at North Carolina. But it, it we see the guy. I think Drake May can be that as a rookie. The see, I don't, I don't think that, and I, th I, I just think it goes back to kind of like the. It's going to sound weird. The Ohio State quarterback philosophy, like. Who the from, helmet scouting? Yeah. Like, who from this school has been a good quarterback? Like, the, the, I think the commanders, even though they have a totally different regime, that they, they're going to go with Jaden Daniels because they've saw, even though they were from the outside, they saw what Sam Howell did for them before, and it wasn't a lot. I, I understand where you're coming from for sure. I, my hang up there is I just don't think Jaden Daniels is going to survive the NFL. I saw earlier today, Jeremy Fowler tweeted out uh, from ESPN. They they did a story. They had a bunch of executives around the league, anonymous executive season, talk about what they think of the top quarterbacks this year. And one said he thinks Jaden Daniels has the ability to be a better passer than Lamar Jackson by a lot, by a much better passer. And said he's got a running ability like Robert Griffin III, who until his knee was turned into mincemeat, pretty talented runner, right? The first reply on Twitter said, he's skinny Justin Fields with a weaker arm. And I think that Twitter user was more correct than that AFC executive who said that about Lamar Jackson. See, I, like, I just, he is so reckless. And it's different because you can say, well, Jalen Hurts was a one year wonder as a passer. And look at him in the NFL. Joe Burrow was the greatest one year wonder, maybe in history, <laughs> ne next to Cam, I guess, but Cam was such a freak. But Burrow was nobody, then out of nowhere becomes a superstar. But Burrow was big, and I think Burrow's better passer than Daniels is, too. I just, I, and I, I don't root against it. I always say this every draft. I never root against these dudes unless I have a reason to root against them because they're a, a bad guy or whatever. I have no reason to root against Jaden Daniels, and I hope if he goes to Washington, New England, wherever, I hope he finds great success. I just don't think he projects well as an NFL player. I said what I said, not realizing that Joe Burrow's like the only good quarterback to make it in the NFL, really. Who was from, LSU. from LSU. From LSU. And wow, incredibly disrespectful to Zach Mettenberger. And another guy that was at LSU kind of makes my point. Uh Jamarcus Russell. 
<laughs> yeah, but Jamarcus Russell also was much more interested in lying to his coaches and drinking Hennessy than he was actually playing football. That's true. Yeah. Like, I, I don't think any, well, and I guess I don't know. I mean, I, everyone thought Jamarcus Russell was going to be a stud. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's a reason he went number one overall. He just loved that purple drink and <laughs> didn't love practice, I'm which a was grip a big and issue. Sip. Yeah. You go grip and sip. The opposite side of this question of the teams that are going to take or could take a quarterback, how many of them and which ones could actually be elevated by taking a rookie, a good rookie QB this year? Like, I, I think the Bears are going to be respectable. I think if it breaks right, they could be a playoff team. Uh, I think so. Because, like, the, the middle class of the NFC is not so that, awesome that, that division, they can't break into it. Sorry, yeah. I'm sorry for cutting you off. That division, the North, can go from, wow, this kind of sucks, to, oh, shoot, that's actually a really good division really quickly if Williams hits. Because I think the Bears can be respectable. The Packers, I think, are on the way up. The Lions should be good again. The worst team in the division might be Minnesota. Yeah. <laughs> Which is funny because they might have the best overall player. And, and they're going to trade up. And Justin like, Jefferson. And they, I think they're the team most likely to trade up for McCarthy. I agree. I think it's them followed by the Giants followed by Denver. So probably the three most likely. The Bears are a for sure. I mean, that's a pretty good situation for a number one overall pick, honestly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're on there. Who else? Like, I think Washington's in an interesting spot because even you said, Spencer, like 2024 is the let's just add talent and see where it goes here. Like 25, 26, that's where you start trying to win a little more, right? Is that fair to say? Yeah, and at one point, my philosophy was draft your quarterback, let him learn the system, don't put him out there, have Sam Howell be your quarterback for the year, your bridge guy. Mm -hmm. Obviously not going to happen, but obviously that's not going to happen. I can understand the logic, though. But I was like, because I I feel like sometimes quarterbacks are forced into things too much. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And it doesn't work out. No, that's that's definitely for sure. So I I wouldn't put them in this class. I would not put New England in this class. New England is, they're going to be bad. And it's we're a complete rebuild. Yeah. And it's way harder to do it anyway in the AFC, given the state of the AFC right now. Like, is any quarterback in this class going to be good enough to trade blows with CJ Stroud and the uh, Tua Tagovailoa and Joe Burrow. Cause that's like your, not your middle class of quarterback, but it's your mm-hmm. middle class of teams, right? Like yeah. your four five, six seed type teams. Like, are, are you getting there with one of these guys? No, I don't think you are. Two teams that could trade up for a quarterback that I think if they get a hit would fall. I, I think Minnesota, if, if they move up to get JJ McCarthy and he, actually is good as a rookie. Well, that certainly helps. They already have a decent set of offensive pieces, including Justin Jefferson. Giants? If they moved up, and and you have to hit. I'm not just saying take a quarterback and then you're fine. They've got to actually be good. I kind of think the Giants could be at least frisky in the NFC East if they had a better quarterback. I think they went to the playoffs two years ago. And I mean, I don't know they don't have Saquon Barkley anymore, but. I, I think you could argue it. Maybe not for sure, but I think you can make an argument for that. I mean, so. I think you can make an argument for any team in the NFC. It's like the, we say the commanders are not plug and play uh, with a quarterback, but you really never know at the NFC East. I mean, the Eagles were the team, and then they kind of started to fall yeah. off at the Dallas end of last hasn't season. Any better? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, they've gotten so, worse. <laughs> and if you look back at the history of the NFC East, it's like there's really no repeat winners. And then so one team's good one year, but then they're bad the next year, and then they're good the next. Like, it's just up and down and up and down. There's no constant yeah. in the NFC East. So the commanders could be the winner. Real quick, uh, you cannot bet the t- the first four picks in mm-hmm. order, but you can bet the first five picks in order at, oh. at FanDuel. The best odds, Williams, Daniels, May, Marvin Harrison Jr., and McCarthy, one through five. Like plus 400 are the lowest odds. I don't hate that. I really don't hate that. Coming up in the 4 o'clock hour, we'll talk to Michael Swain. We'll talk some Chiefs football, too, on 5 Sports Talk.
now, 4 o'clock hour of 580 Sports Talk, going up on a Tuesday. Brendan Dwarzynski, Dan Lucero, and Spencer Dupuy joining you today. Thanks for spending some of your Tuesday afternoon with us. We've got some NFL draft, some Chiefs draft coming up here in just a moment. We'll also pick a winner today in What is Wrong With You coming up here in a little bit. And Michael Swain will join us at the bottom of the hour for Jayhawk Weekly on the Fleming Place Wine and Spirits Hotline. Don't forget, you can let us know your thoughts on whatever we're talking about on the show via the Top City Metal Supply text line. That number is 785-272-9429. Also on YouTube, you can find us. Our channel is called 580 Sports Talk. The easiest way to find us is to just go to youtube.com, search 580 Sports Talk, and uh, we'll be the first result. Easy to find us. Subscribe to our channel while you're there, and you can watch the show on YouTube. You guys up for a keyword? How are we feeling about keywords for this 4 o'clock hour? Let's go. Love it. Like AOL all over again. We've got keywords for you. For the Choose Your Trip 2024 contest from Alpha Media, a trip wherever you want to go. All you have to do to enter is to enter this keyword at our website, 580wibw.com, between right now and 5 o'clock on the dot, when we will have one more keyword for you today. Our 4 o'clock hour keyword is Festival, F-E-S-T-I-V-A-L, Festival. Head over to 580wibw.com and then click on the Choose Your Trip link and you can enter the keyword Festival. It only works during the 4 o'clock hour. We'll have a new one at 5 o'clock. There's Another, a, there was a big music festival this last weekend. Yeah, uh, Coachella. Was it second weekend or first weekend? I think uh, it's first weekend. I think first. Okay. Yeah. You ever been to a music festival? No, no, I know you. Well, I feel like a, a one day okay. festival. Yeah, yeah, not a, like not like going out in the middle of the desert and been to Burning Man or anything like that. Stagecoach yeah. is coming up too. Stagecoach is coming up. Yeah, it, we're approaching festival season. I haven't been in a long time. I think 2015 might have been the last time I did Lollapalooza in Chicago. Oh I loved, yeah, yeah, I loved it. I did, but I always the night. The Sunday night, getting home, or certainly the next Monday, oh, my God, just dead to the yeah. world. Sore, tired. Ugh. I couldn't do it again. That That's a sign of me being washed, but that's okay. I could not do a three-day music festival again. It beat my ass <laughs> badly. <laughs> I did see Metallica the last time I went, though, though, so that was pretty sick. I also saw Paul McCartney, but I left after, like, 20 minutes. Not a big Beatles or Wings fan, to be honest. I went and saw Flying Lotus instead. Hmm. One of my favorite acts. I, I what what are the first twenty minutes of a Paul McCartney show? Like, is he giving you like you already got to you have to jump out with something good? But yeah. Then, like, is he settling into like Wings stuff? Or like, what is he? Yeah. I, what is a Paul McCartney set list uh, sound like? It was. I'm trying. It was mostly Beatles stuff that we heard. I think I left when he started playing some new song. Yeah. That would be when I would leave. I'm not trying to hear new Paul McCartney. Yeah, okay. All right, I guess I am I just found the set list. He mixed a few things up here. Um, yeah, he led off with Magical Mystery Tour. Got to get you into my life. Ah, oh, heater. I learned how to play that on the recorder in second grade. Wow. <laughs> what a deep dive there. I don't think I ever learned anything quite that extreme on Hot cross the recorder. Was about yeah. a, I got <laughs> Hot cross buns. Hot See, cross buns. We, we were oh, out there man. making real music with the with the recorder. Um, let me roll by let me roll it by wings. Did I I think I left then. I think I heard the fourth <laughs> song and said, All right, I don't need wings. I have a question. Where are we at on like music mixes? What do you what mean? do you mean? Like uh have you heard of Big Booty Mix? <laughs> that is legit a thing. Uh, <laughs> what are we talking about, man? I don't know. I mean, I, I'm starting I, to feel real old again. I yeah, appreciate I, it. Is so, this like ass jams? No, it's just like know, songs mixed together C with CBS like bangers, like a mashup. Yeah, it's like a mashup. Yeah, but like between the mashups, the beat drops. Yeah, they yeah, use yeah. like phrases and stuff. So like the one from 2023 or 2022 used the. Uh, Tom Brenneman's <laughs> it's a deep drive to left field. I don't know that one. I, I think I sort of vaguely know what you're talking about. And then though. like they used one recently with the, the lady that quit her job at Walmart. That went viral. <laughs> this is like too terminally online. Even for me, I think I don't know. Do, so they do like a 
festival like they do like a concert huh. where they debut their next mix huh no i i was not aware of this no nah, i never heard of it in my life no i uh two friends that's the name of their okay yeah i uh i, I missed that like on that way diplo or calvin harris or, okay all but right. like they're like those are names I know. They're like in the new thing where they make mixes and then put it, people actually go to these things. We should have done this year. We should have done the Coachella, like Coachella band or I made it up right now and see how many <laughs> we could get. Because um, I, I saw the lineup and it, it, it hurt my brain. I, I thought you, you people need Jesus. If you're, you're listening to this and I, I'm not afraid to say that. Um, Justice was there. You know Justice? Or I, Justice, as I know most of say. I know Justice. Yes. D-A-N-C-E? Yeah. They're French. Justice. Yeah. Deftones played there this year. I'm pretty sure Justice was on an MLB The Show soundtrack. Oh, I'm sure they were. Sure they were. Um. All right, Spencer. Real band or something I just made up in my head right now? Clowncore. Definitely a real band. Yes, correct. That is a real, real <laughs> band. Cowpunk. Uh, yes, a real band. No, I made it up. That's a genre, actually. That's like country punk, essentially. We could do this all day. This is a huge festival, and most of them I don't know. I've never heard of the last dinner party. The Aquabats played. I know you know them. Yeah. Totally. No doubt got back together at Coachella this year. Yeah, they did a they yeah, they they did their whole show. Like there's somebody out there doing like a note for note cover of I'm just a girl, and then there's rapping in the verses instead. It sucks. What? I hear it on the radio a lot. Ew. Yeah, it really it's really bad. It stinks. I've never heard I love that song. I love No Doubt. Yeah. I'm a big Gwen Stefani fan. Yeah, No Doubt's great, but they did that song and it blows big time. It, it awful. Um is it by Florence and the Machine? No. Maggie Lindemann? Mm, probably not. I don't know. I, I have not heard. There's a whole wow, the somebody from the 785 just said I'm kind of lame. <laughs> You're kind of lame. That's what they said. They said the new guy is kind of lame. No disrespect. <laughs> what? <laughs> no disrespect. I'm going to immediately disrespect you, though. Come yeah. on. Come on. That's um. <laughs> yeah. I'm. I like to. I like to play the game with the Coachella poster where I try to go as far down the list of uh, acts and see, uh, like, what's the smallest print one that I've heard of. Um, how, how many can you name let's uh i am familiar i believe with uh i feel like i've heard of one o tricks point never i don't know what kind of music they See, do i did not know that one. but i've heard i've heard that before i had never heard of man i'm really before. strong I, I, there's I, somebody I, going to stagecoach named a seep asleep at the wheel That's asleep at the wheel yeah they're old yeah. they did christmas in jail the greatest Christmas song. Yeah, I remember Sleep at the Wheel. Yeah. Yeah. I know that. Backwoods Barbie. <laughs> that sounds like a stagecoach yeah. act. That, that sounds right. Honky right, we, Tonkin and Queens. All right, we've got some actual football we need to get to here. Let's do it. Dan, yeah. you were asking me about this earlier today. We know the Chiefs need a wide receiver, obviously. What kind of wide receiver? Not all wide receivers are created equal. And that is why some teams this year view Malik Neighbors from LSU higher than they view Marvin Harrison Jr. They might just need a different flavor. They need someone who is better at the catch point or someone who's better after the catch or whatever it might end up being. Like Malik Neighbors is better after the catch than Marvin Harrison Jr. I would still take Marv, Maserati Marv, as Gus Johnson would call him. Of the top three guys, quick, quick aside, mm -hmm. of the top three guys, do you rank them Marvin, Adunze, and Neighbors? Or do you like Neighbors better than, than Odunze? I would put Odunze ahead of Neighbors, but honestly, like, the the gap between the three, not visual medium, but if you're watching the video, like, almost touching each other. Like, I think they're really... I would put Marv first. I would put Odunze slightly ahead of Neighbors, but I think they're all closer together than a lot of people do. Like, the casual draft, Nick probably says, yeah, Marvin Harrison and then everyone else. I... I think Adunze is going to be really good. I think he's going to be a really good NFL player. Not to out myself as a casual draft, Nick. I like Odunze a lot. I also think that Marvin Harrison Jr. is, like, generational. I think he can be. I think he can be. If he had a little bit more foot speed, 
I think we would be talking about him the way we talked about we talked about I was much younger at the time like Julio <laughs> Jones when <laughs> even when the Falcons traded all those picks for a wide receiver and everyone said this is insane mm-hmm. there was also an air of I mean it is insane but also this dude is going to be an all-time great and he has been he's yeah. going to Hall of Fame going yeah. to Hall of Fame yeah that's I, I think that's the only thing just like top tier elite speed for hair, I mean, he's not slow. Mm-hmm. He's not plotting. Like, like, he's still fast. Yeah, I mean, if he could run like Brian Thomas Jr. could. Yes, I I think I would consider him then probably among the best that I've seen in the time that I've really followed the draft like that. I, I like him a lot, though. I, I think he deserves to be a top five pick. I, I would say so for yeah. sure. So what is the type of receiver that the Chiefs most need? Is it another burner? Because Hollywood Brown's only on a one-year deal. Is it separator like they normally go for? Are you saying big body? Because the Chiefs she, she don't have a big receiver. They haven't had a big receiver since Bo. And what guys fit that role for this team? I, I think you should be able to get at least one of any of those types at 32 without moving. It might not be your top choice, but you should be able to get somebody from each of those camps with the 32nd overall pick. So I, I don't think you're getting a guy as good as Jamar Chase, like obviously. No. But what the trait of Chase is, because Chase is a really good yards after the catch guy too, obviously. I mean, he's one of the three best receivers in football. There's nothing he doesn't do well. But the thing about Chase, when Cincinnati has beaten the Chiefs, Chase has been in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. Made some big plays. We re- we all remember the tune in a can game. <laughs> yes. Uh He's he's made some big, big plays. And a lot of them have come in situations where, okay, it's third and eight. And even if you're not open, you're open because the ball's coming to you and this guy's going to catch it. I don't know. Like that guy is Travis Kelsey for the Chiefs. And it has been Travis Kelsey for the Chiefs for a very long time. And it's why the Chiefs passing game has been able to function the way it has been able to function despite not having certainly the last two years, anybody you consider elite at the wide receiver position, because there comes a time in every big game where I just got to make, a, I, I got to have somebody catch a pass. I, I Heat's coming. We're not going to have a lot of time for the play to develop. I just need somebody to run their route, beat their man, fend off their man at the catch point and haul it in so we can keep the chains moving and keep this drive going. Mm-hmm. Travis Kelsey's been that guy again for the Chiefs for, for, for quite a long time. I think the Chiefs need that kind of wide receiver in this draft. They need a guy who's going to go catch a sideline fade over a defensive back on a third and long. I I need the drive extender. I need the player who is open even when they aren't open. I, I, I think that those are the traits that I'm looking for. It's why I really like A.D. Mitchell, because I think mm-hmm. he's got not just the speed, but he's got at 6'2", a bit of that mismatch size where he can go up and he can get it Mm -hmm. and he can make catches and he can can go high point a ball in a way that the chiefs really haven't had a guy who could do that since Tyreek Hill. That's why he's my favorite of the, the realistic draft targets for the chiefs guys. I think we'll be there at 32. Yeah. AD Mitchell's my favorite. And and the reason he's my favorite is I really like his ability to win one-on-one to win on the sideline, to win with his size, to win with his speed, to make plays in a lot of different ways. I think he is as complete a receiver as the Chiefs could realistically expect to get at 32. For what it's worth about A.D. Mitchell, I was looking through various blogs and websites and whatnot um, for just, just what people view about this wide receiver class. And Kyle Posey of Niners Nation, which is over at SB Nation, who... Uh, we tried to get on Super Bowl week, but then he didn't respond to our call, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> his top two receivers in the class, number one is Marvin. He's got the top two as their own tier. Number one is Marvin Harrison Jr. Number two is A.D. Mitchell. And he has a line on his breakdown that says, do not let the Chiefs draft him or next year it will look like the Vikings in 1998. Do you know who was a rookie for the Minnesota Vikings in 1998? Randy Moss. Randy Moss. With Dante Culpepper before the injuries. Yep. Um... And it was one of the greatest offenses we've ever seen in NFL history. 
That is impressive. He says he, he broke them all down in various. These are the guys who are separators. These are the ball winners. He said he could have put A.D. Mitchell in pretty much any of the categories. I like Mitchell a lot. That is one of the guys I would move for. If he was still there, like 23 or later, I would move up for A.D. Mitchell. That w- That's a small group, but I would put him in that group. I like him a lot. I thought you might be going with Keon Coleman there. See, I like Keon Coleman, too, because he's another guy. I think, uh, what do you have, 11 touchdowns last year? Half of them were on fades. Like, And, and as much mm-hmm. as I hate the fade on principle, I like a guy who can go get a fade. She's never had that guy. Yeah, and, I like that he can do it. And I think I would trust Mahomes to throw a fade as much as I trust any quarterback in the league to go do it. Mm-hmm. So I like the thought of a 6'3 guy like Keon Coleman as a red zone target. But when you think about traits that the Chiefs have valued, we know they like separators. We know they like guys who can make plays after the catch, who can separate. Keon Coleman ran a 4-6. Not and, great speed. And, and look, straight line, 40-yard dash speed isn't everything. I still think that Keon Coleman in the right situation could be a good pro, but I don't think he's the guy that's as well-rounded as I, I think the Chiefs are going to be looking for here. I, I think you want somebody to... Theoretically, you're thinking that, A, Rashi Rice is going to avoid jail time, and two, he is going to be a big part of your passing game for the next three seasons. I think you want somebody who complements that, Mm -hmm. and that's why I don't think it makes a whole lot of sense to have your eyes on the smaller guy. Like, Lad McConkey to me, doesn't make a lot of sense. Uh, Roman Wilson doesn't make a lot of sense. I like Roman. I actually like Wilson better than I like McConkey, but that's a different discussion. But, like, smaller slot type guys, mm-hmm. like, to me, that's not the kind of thing. I, I think you want somebody. It's already a small room. Yes. You don't have a lot of size in the room. Justin Watson is your big wide receiver. So, I. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Wow, that's a horrible thing to have. Well, I mean, that... what, what is he, 6'4", six, 6'5"? Six, yeah. Like, he's legitimately big. But you don't think of him as a guy who's going to go win the ball, no, right? No. He's hot. We're going to put the ball up. 25 yards down the field. It's going to be you in a corner and you're going to go get the ball. Now, I don't ever want him doing that. He <laughs> has done that. What was what was the game where he made that catch on third down? Uh, kept the drive going. It was a divisional game. I don't recall. Was it a division? Was it the, was it the first Oakland game? It was some, I, I he made, he he's made some big plays for the chiefs. Like I, I don't mm-hmm. want to completely cr- uh, dump on Justin Watson, but like he's the big receiver in the room. Yeah. So I do. I, I don't think looking at the, the 5'10", 6' foot class of receivers, I, I want a bigger body in the room. Now, again, that's why uh, A.D. Mitchell is 6'2", so uh, appealing to me. Yeah, I, I would like Mitchell. I would like him a lot in that spot. By the way, for Coleman, I wanted, I checked his uh, relative athletic score because I thought I, I knew the straight line speed wasn't great, although he did have a good split. The first 10 yards, he was really good. He didn't do the agility testing at the combine, which is so frustrating because then these guys get great athletic scores. But, okay, they're tall, and they've got good weight, and a good broad jump, all good things. But if you're not telling me how good you are side to side, especially for a wide receiver, that's really important. So I, it, that's frustrating with Coleman. I'm sure the Chiefs have some sort of measure on that. A couple other guys that I am certainly interested in, I don't know how much of a fit he is. Uh, Evan Lazar, who writes for Patriots.com, but he he's more than just a team reporter. I mean, he does some real good in-depth stuff. He's got Troy Franklin as a comparison. Uh, his pro comp is Jerry Judy. I loved Judy coming out of college. I thought he was going to be too. a really good NFL player because he was a good route runner. And he's got Franklin as a comp to Jerry Judy and says that he's got good speed, maybe not elite, but he's good going vertically even without elite speed. He's not super physical and he's pretty thin. I don't know how much the Chiefs would like a receiver like that. I like Franklin's game a lot, though. Uh, he likes Roman Wilson quite a bit, calls him a high-end number two, which the more I watched Russell or Russell Roman Wilson this year, the more I really liked him as a player. The one guy who I'm out on, I, I'm out on uh, Ricky Pearsall. I, I do not like that fit for the Chiefs. I think that is way too much steering into the slot receiver thing. I also don't know how good of a route runner he is. So I think to me, the ideal guy would be, Honestly, the ideal guy to me would be Roma Dunze, but he's not going to make it to 32 or right. anywhere the Chiefs could trade to. And I and I don't think Brian Thomas will either. Matt uh, Matt Verderam, friend of the program, uh, on his podcast uh, today, and he's got this clip out. You can see it on uh, – it's it's his Patreon podcast, Matt Verderam Show, uh, but he's got the clip on his uh, Twitter account. If you find him on Twitter, at Matt Verderam, 
Uh, he says that Brian Thomas is the guy that if he's still sitting there in the early 20s, the Chiefs should move mountains to make that happen. Could see it. The thing with Thomas, I think there's a little bit more floor there than there is for A.D. Mitchell. There are some questions about Thomas's route running, toughness, hands that there maybe aren't about A.D. Mitchell. Like the upside for Thomas is bigger, but the floor is, I think, a lot lower than uh, than Mitchell's is. One other player that I want to bring up really quickly, he came up in Peter Schrager's mock at NFL.com today. Yes. Or or was it yesterday whenever it came out? Jalen Polk at Washington. Washington had three really good wide receivers the last two years. Romo Dunes had the best of the group, Jalen Polk, and then Jalen McMillan as well. I don't know what the grades look like around the league for Jalen Mc, or Jalen Polk, excuse me. I have a thought that he might be available sometime later on in the second round where you might be able to get him at a real value. I like Jalen Polk a lot. And in terms of just the quality of player and what he brings to the table, if the Chiefs said that is our guy, we want him at 32, I would say, good, awesome, great, take the guy. Because I think he's a really good player. He really popped just watching the games. Not even saying watch the All-22. Just watch the games. Jalen Polk was awesome for Washington. That's another dude I'd be happy with. I don't know what the value looks like for him, and that's obviously important come draft time. But just in terms of the player, I like Polk a lot. Find a way to get that guy. I'd be content with it. What is wrong with you is coming up next. Then we'll move on to some KU talk. We will get to Michael Swain and Jayhawk Weekly coming up on 5 Sports Talk.
to find today's winner and maybe a new weekly winner in What is Wrong with You here on 580 Sports Talk. Of course, it's going to be hard to beat yesterday's winner here on the program. The 37-year veteran of the police force in Cambridge, um, Massachusetts. I almost said Missouri. Yes. Cambridge, Massachusetts, who went to the bathroom and hung his gun on the coat rack in the stall. It went off. That was <laughs> um, That was very dumb. My story today also involves a loaded gun. We're going down to Florida and the Tampa International Airport. We're back in August. A man, Abraham Yacoub of Lakeland, walked into the airport to board a flight to Las Vegas. He was seen entering the TSA screening line where he unloaded his backpack, his shoes, and some other personal items. When TSA electronically screened his items with the x-ray machine, they found a firearm inside his bag. Dude, what are you doing? So as officers attempted to find the bag with the gun, Yakub grabbed it off the conveyor belt and quickly walked into the nearest men's bathroom. That is where he wrapped the gun in toilet paper and hid it in a trash can. <laughs> when Yakub returned to the TSA area, an officer confronted him, and Yakub claimed he did not bring a gun into the airport. <laughs> The airport terminal was evacuated of passengers and multiple flights were delayed as officers arrived to question the man. Officers searched the restroom he was last seen in and found the black gun with 14 rounds of ammunition inside a magazine loaded into it. Yakub pleaded guilty to one count of violating airport security requirements and one count of attempted possession of a dangerous weapon on an aircraft. He faces up to 10 years in prison on each count. Man, you're talking about making a bad situation worse. I guess one thing, it's happened. People forget that they got a gun in their bag and then they take it to the airport. Mm -hmm. like, you, know, you know, it's that's tough. But but that might be the kind of thing you can plead your way out of if you've got no criminal history, which uh, we don't know if this guy does. Um, you might be able to plead your way down to a misdemeanor there, avoid jail time, mm -hmm. pay a fine, slap on the wrist, probation. You were dumb. Don't be dumb again. That kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You you exacerbate your problem when you go try and hide it and then play it dumb when the cops are in your grill. Say, hey, uh, so we saw you had a gun. No, you didn't. <laughs> Wrapping it in toilet paper. What's yeah. that thing wadded up down there? We, oh, I'm sure it's nothing. We watched you with a gun in your bag, and then we watched you walk into the bathroom, and now you don't have a gun. Anything you want to tell us? No. <laughs> Also, this one the video can be manipulated. Fake news. Yeah. Deep fake. This one also gets bonus. What is wrong with you points because it ruined other people's days. Mm -hmm. All right, Dan, real quick. What do you got? All right. We are going to St. Petersburg, Florida. We meet 32 year old Joseph Triselt and 62 year old Elvis Singleton. They are roommates. Triselt. What? Yes. <laughs> Triselt was making pizza Thursday evening. And while preparing the delicacy, Triselt told the police Singleton started making sounds like coughing in a way that was to irritate him. Triselt also reported hearing voices telling him how to make the pizza. That made Triselt upset. He threw a chunk of pizza dough on the floor and then threw it at Singleton, hitting him in the head as he was seated at the dining room table with his back to Triselt. Police reported there was no visible bruising to Singleton as a result of the dough strike. And Triselt admitted to tossing the dough because Singleton was making coughing sounds they did not like. He was arrested for misdemeanor battery, booked into the county jail, also charged with criminal mischief for allegedly breaking a piece of furniture in Singleton's room. Last year, Triselt was busted for walloping Singleton after being upset about a coughing noise. And yet they continued to live together for another year. Yeah. And uh, this time, at least he didn't punch him in the face. Just threw pizza dough at him. Why are a 32-year-old and a 62-year-old living together? Now you've ruined two things. You've ruined that guy's night, and you've ruined dinner. <laughs> All right, who gets the win for today? Here's two good ones. <laughs> the guy with the gun yeah. lying about having a gun was really, really funny. I can only imagine how terribly wrapped it was in the toilet paper, too. <laughs> Just sort of the wound no around it. sticking out. Like, yeah. At least he didn't hang it on, a, uh, on the uh, stall. That's true. So we've got two gun... Is that your vote, too? Yeah. Yeah, mine too. That's a sweep today. Does that beat our other gun goof from yesterday? No. A police officer really ought to know better than to hang his gun by the Yeah. Yep. Like, that's going to be, like, as far as what is wrong with you goes. Nah, I'm with you. That's 
that one's going to be tough to beat. It is our return champion and now defending champion in What Is Wrong With You here on 580 Sports Talk. Jayhawk Weekly is up next with Michael Swain here on 580 WWW. for Jayhawk Weekly here on 580 Sports Talk. Michael Swain joining us on the Fleming Place Wine and Spirits Hotline. You can find his work over at Fog.net where he has the absolute best coverage and actual new breaking news updates going on with all things KU, unlike some other websites out there. You can also find him on Twitter at mswain247. I am certainly not talking about anyone in particular. Michael, what's going on, man? Not much, not much. I feel like a... It, well, look, guys, this time of year is crazy, right? Spring football just wrapped up. Mm-hmm. Right? Football portal opened today. Basketball portal is going crazy. High school basketball recruiting is starting to pick up. Like, I feel like I'm like Mr. Krabs, that meme where like he's spinning his head around. Like, that's, <laughs> that, that's what this time of year is like. So, um, definitely, you know, obviously enjoy this stuff. Man, it is uh, busy. Lots going on. Yes, and we have plenty of football that we're going to get to here in just a moment. The spring showcase this past Friday night. I know you were there taking it all in. We've got a bunch to get to. Do you want to start, though, with KU recruiting on the basketball side, specifically out of the transfer portal? Rylan Griffin, the wing from Alabama. This, to me, Michael, and it it, it sounds right now like, like things are positive, still have to seal the deal, and we know with the portal, crazy things can happen. He, to me, feels, though, like, the must-have piece in the portal this year. I love Zeke Mayo. I like the Riley Kugel ad. But this reminds me, and I said this yesterday, a little bit of Remy Martin, not in terms of the kind of player, but just in the sense that when Remy was in the portal a few years ago, it felt like, wow, that is a perfect fit for KU's needs that year, and it ended up working out pretty well. I feel like Griffin is sort of in a similar mold in terms of need. Why is he such a good fit potentially for this KU roster? Well, I actually think it's more like Kevin McCullough, honestly, where he has the, you know, the the power five production, multiple years left. Um, you are right, right. 
you know, someone like Ryan Griffin would be a perfect fit for this Kansas team right now because you look at what the roster looks like, and obviously, you know, there's Dewan Harris, um, someone like El Marco Jackson, and uh, Zeke Mayo, right? You've got like some backcourt pieces, and then what really KU is missing right now is some guys on the wing. And obviously, Riley Kugel is someone that will play on the wing. I think we talked last week about right now trying to get too caught up in who is starting, who's coming off the bench. Because players like this come available. And when you're talking this time last week, right, this wasn't public. And I think this is the type of guy that you can plug in at that three spot, right? Because I think the anticipation is that Johnny Furphy will go to the NBA draft. And I think the feeling is that you add someone like Ryan Griffin and, and he just fits in perfectly, right? Shot 39% from three last year, six foot six, can kind of play anywhere two through three. Probably not necessarily going to be a guy that plays a lot at the four. I think KU will try and avoid that because he is a little bit more of a slender build, but he's someone that also brings some athletic pop and has an NBA upside too, if he can continue to be more consistent. So he really is like, you're going to drop like what Kansas needs right now. It's guys that can bring athleticism, that can bring some versatility, that can bring some floor spacing. And if you put a bunch of those guys around Hunter Dickinson and Dewan Harris, like, I think that's a really strong lineup. And then you also factor someone in like KJ Adams and what he can offer you um, with certain packages and you put more spacing around him and all of a sudden like the roster construction can be it becomes a lot more clear how this is all going to work out where I think last year it kind of felt like you had to squint and a lot of it was riding on Nick Timberlake where you know if KU is able to get over the line with with Ryan Griffin in the next week like I think there's a good chance that you can see it full front you know, like you know Zeke Mayo it fits right he can shoot he can create his own shots you know someone like Riley Kugel has NBA upside if you can put it all together. And then you got someone like Ryan Griffin who has the proven production. So you can kind of see how this roster construction just feels probably a lot more certain than last year where it was, hey, can Arterio Morris, you know, be available first of all, but second of all, can he improve as a shooter? Can Nick Timberlake translate that from Towson up to the Big 12 level? Like, and now there's just so much more, I would say margin for error, where if you miss on one guy, all right, whatever. There are other guys that have that proven production at this level um, to be able to step in. If KU is able to land Ryland Griffin, and again, I mean, it, it sounds like it things are moving in a good direction. I know you've had reporting behind VIP over at fog.net about it. This is why you got to be a VIP over at 24 7 Sports, guys. After that, so let's say hypothetical here KU is able to land Ryland Griffin. Awesome. He's going to start this coming year. You're feeling great if you're KU. How aggressive is Bill Self and this coaching staff going to be after other guys who are still out there in the portal? Because there are still plenty of talented guys out there, guys who have ties to KU. How aggressive will KU be trying to go after another piece? Well, I think pretty aggressive. And this is something I'll probably hit on in an update tonight. You know, I, KU, by taking those two scholarships last year and vacating them, Kansas does have flexibility this offseason where – if they decide they want to go with 13, they can go with 13 players, right? And you just push the scholarship to next year. And look, there's so many guys departing after next year. You think about KJ Adams, Dewan Harris, and if Hunter Dickinson comes back as expected, he'll be gone. Like, vacating a scholarship next year won't be an issue if Kansas has to. So I think we'll just see Kansas try and add more good players and kind of see where the cards fall. I think they'll still put it um, you know, pretty succinctly saying that, hey, look, the dust hasn't settled yet on the roster. And I think Kansas is going to take the approach of, you know, you go out and you try to add impact players and you kind of keep doing that until you have scholarship spots and then you see what happens. And if guys decide, okay, now this looks a lot different than, you know, in, in whatever, late March when we had discussions first with the coaching staff, maybe they decide to leave. And if not, whatever, you know, Kansas is able to add impact players, have a much better roster, a lot more depth and, Maybe you end up redshirting someone. Like I think there's just a a lot more flexibility Kansas has this offseason. I think they're going to really lean on that and try and just improve this roster and add as many good pieces as possible. And look, I think right now Kansas can have a pretty strong bargaining position as well. You look at the roster. You look what you have. You have experienced players. What have seen the NCAA tournament? Right, experience wins, and that's a pretty good sell to players in the portal who typically are older, want to have. Um, a place where they can show themselves. And what does Bill Self say all the time, right? If you win, the pie is big enough for everyone. I think that'll be kind of his recruiting pitch. And I'm sure there'll be some players that look at the roster and say, okay, you know, maybe I'm not going to be a 35-minute per game guy, but hey, if I can give 20 good minutes per game and we win a lot of basketball games, I can lift a trophy and cut down some nets at the end. That sounds good to me. So I think that's kind of the route he's going to try and take. 
We're joined by Michael Swain. He covers the Kansas Jayhawks for Fog.net, which is part of the 24-7 Sports Network. He's also on Twitter, at mswain 24 He joins us every Tuesday at this time for Jayhawk Weekly on the Fleming Place Wine and Spirits Hotline. Yesterday, KU women's basketball landed a transfer, Michael, in uh, Sanaya Copeland, who is from KCK, played at Olathe North, great prep player in mm-hmm. Kansas, was good at Wisconsin, started all year last year. She transfers back closer to home for KU. The connection that mostly the, you know, the, the Twitter burners came up with was she's allegedly dating AJ Store, who is at Wisconsin this past year, one of the best <laughs> players in the portal. He's going through the NBA draft process right now. Who knows if he's going to come to college, but people are trying to connect the dots right there. Is there any smoke to that? Or should we be focusing just on KU women's basketball, just landed a good player and leave it at that? Yeah, I think that people wanted me to mention that, right? The, and I think you, you, you use the word alleged there, and I think that's going to carry a lot of weight, right? I don't mm-hmm. know for a fact, you know, I think there's plenty of speculation about that. But look, I don't think that really matters, if I'm being honest here. I think what matters here is that the women's basketball team got a really good player, and they have a lot of needs right now. You think about all the players that left, and there aren't a bunch of young players who had a little bit of production last year. Like, there's a lot of production that left, and and. Sonia Copeland's the game's getting someone to average seven points per game, right? It's not going to be flashy, but on a Wisconsin team that had two really star players that averaged over 10 points per game, and then a bunch of people that averaged seven. And so I think there's reason to believe that someone like Sonia, who also has a relationship with Samaya Nichols, um, who obviously is a star in her own right, like that's a pretty good start, I think, for this offseason for the women's basketball team when they have to replace so much and I think keep someone like Samai around, right? You gotta build the team around her because she is a rising star in college women's college basketball. So look, if you wanna talk about who she's dating, like fine, whatever. I, I don't think that really is gonna impact either her decision to go to Kansas or AJ Store's decision if he does decide to go back to school or go to Kansas. Regarding Store, do you think it's more likely he stays in the draft? Because I feel like there's been so little uh portal buzz about him that almost feels more likely that his next game is either is professional well (laughs) how can i frame this i think sometimes uh the way you handle things when you first go in the portal can change things for you in terms of what the outlook is and i think that's probably what's happened here and i think there is talk that he might stay in the draft and i think that is um accurate right he could I think if he goes back to college, I think Kansas is in a strong position. And I think there might be some other teams that might be willing to circle back later on and see how things are and what things are looking like. But I think this is a situation where I think he is fully focused on the NBA draft right now and wants to go pro like everybody does, right? Kevin McCullough this time last year, I know did not have any desire to go back to Kansas. But then the draft process happens and reality kind of hits you in the face because the NBA draft doesn't care who you are in college. They care about who you are as a prospect. So, you know, right now I think AJ Store is focused on the draft. I think it would not surprise me whatsoever if he does go back to school. I think if he does decide to do that, I think Kansas will be in a strong position because they've been recruiting him all the time, where I think some schools may have just cooled on him. Another name uh, in the last 24 hours, and of course this is all so fluid and there'll be new names, I'm sure, probably before we go to sleep tonight and more throughout <laughs> the week that uh, – that come out that are uh, at least of some intrigue, but the latest new shiny toy uh, on the, uh, on the, in the transfer portal who has some connection to Kansas is Kobe Bray, a dead eye shooter out of Dayton uh, who helped the flyers to the NCAA tournament this past year. He has mentioned that he has heard from Kansas. What's the fit there? And is that a player who uh, could be in the mix for bill self? Um, Well, so Kansas has interest in him. Um, He is a great shooter and would definitely help Kansas in the floor spacing department. I think the question is fit, role, what does that look like? What can he get elsewhere? You know, UConn is a school that I think um, has also reached out to him and probably has a little bit more to offer in terms of minutes, in terms of role. Um, And so I think right now, you know, Kansas is interested, kind of one of those where we'll have to see where it goes. I think someone like Riley Griffin is Kansas' big priority right now, and I don't know if Kansas is going to put him on the back burner, you know, for someone like Kobe. So I think right now, you know, Griffin priority, um, I would not get too enthused with, with, with Kobe right now. I think that's one that maybe you just see how it plays out over time. And maybe that's one can, you know, push this forward a little bit later. 
Flipping over to football as we continue on with Jayhawk Weekly with Michael Swain of Fog.net here on 580 Sports Talk. And again, head over to Fog.net and 24-7 Sports for all of Michael's fantastic coverage of the Kansas Jayhawks. A lot to get to from the Spring Showcase on Friday, but paramount to a lot of fans and certainly the most intriguing part of it. How did Jalen Daniels look? Yeah, he looked pretty good. I think, honestly, look, I didn't expect him to throw. He hasn't really thrown too much all spring, and I think coaches have alluded to that. Players have alluded to that. You know, or sorry, he's not done 11-on-11 11 11 throw this spring with full pads on. Like, he's done 7-on-7 seven seven stuff. But look, when he ran out there, I was like, oh, I wonder if he's actually going to throw. And then first play, I think, was a handoff. And then second play, sure enough, he you know throws the, the ball to Quinn Skinner, and I thought it looked good, and he had the zip on the ball, and you looked at him during the 7-on-7 seven seven portion. You can just see the arm talent he has developed over time compared to someone like Cole Ballard or Isaiah Marshall, where just when he's throwing it, there's just a little bit more zip on it than I think the, the true freshmen. So I think it's really huge for Kansas that he was able to ramp up to this level over the course of spring. And now it's about, hey, getting him ready for August. Can he have a good summer, no setbacks, and really be able to go in preseason camp where I'm sure KU will still be very, very cautious with him because everything rides on Jalen Daniels' health this year. Kansas is not going to reach its goals if Jalen Daniels does not play in 12 games. So I think for KU, it's huge that he was just able to showcase, hey, a little bit of that on Friday. Let's do a little stock up, stock down here in these last couple of minutes, Michael. We'll start with the good, whether it was end of spring practice or the showcase itself, who really helped out their stock uh, as the spring wound down? Um, That's a good question. I, I think some offensive linemen, you know, someone like Logan Brown had a, had a rough spring last year. I think adapting is hard, and, and Scott Fuchs is a, you know, or was, I should say, a different type of offensive line coach at the college level. Um, I think Daryl Palsa is much more rules-driven than, like, theoretical-driven, and so I think that really does help players. And so Logan Brown really helped himself. I, I think you look on offense, uh, freshman running back Kerry Stewart really helped himself. He's someone that may, maybe fans won't see this fall, but look, he's got the physical traits to be a, a big-time back at KU. Um, Dean Miller is someone on the defensive line that got a lot of praise, so I think those are kind of the three guys that just immediately come to mind. That's funny you asked me about that. I'm going to have a, a story later this week or next week about some more guys and probably seven or eight guys total that I've got as kind of stock risers. But those are just some ones that immediately come to mind. On the other side, and I, I don't want to throw too much cold water on anything. This is the time of year when everyone should be excited about the, the <laughs> upcoming football season. But who maybe didn't shower themselves in glory over these last few weeks and at the showcase? Was there anyone who you feel like kind of left something out there who really needed to have a better showing? Um, I don't know, guys. Like, I, I think you look at more who's available and who isn't available. Mm-hmm. Who might not be available for a long time. You know, so I think someone like Deshaun Hanneke, who probably isn't going to be available for the start of the season. Yeah. Like, yeah, that's a stock down because he would have been really impactful for Kansas. I think someone like Dylan Brooks getting hurt. That's not great because Kansas needed him to have an Austin Booker type of trajectory. So I think those are probably some of the guys that you think about, you know, the availability is so important in football, right? You know, guys can have all the talent in the world, but if they're not around to play, you can't really realize that. So that's kind of where my mind goes with, with stock up, stock down type of stuff because the stock down is so hard because everyone develops at their own pace, mm-hmm. at their own rate. And I think it's harder to sometimes project, hey, you know, maybe this player had other stuff going on, right? Maybe they're playing through an injury during spring. Maybe they're just trying to – adapt to new things. So uh, stock down kind of harder to do, honestly. Got about a minute here. How weird was watching football, even in scrimmage form at Rock Chalk Park? Oh, I loved it. I thought the atmosphere was great. Look, and it's probably going to be there next year um, because of the, the stadium. I thought it was really cool. I thought the fans were into it. Um, it seemed like a really fun atmosphere. And hopefully, I mean, more people want to go out to Rock Chalk Park. It really is such a cool facility. And I think there are a fair amount of people that hadn't been out there before. They got to see it. So I think it's pretty cool. You are not going to find any better coverage of the Kansas Jayhawks than what Michael Swain is cooking up over at Fog.net. It's part of the 24-7 Sports Network. VIP, 100% worth it. We're all members over there. It is so, so useful if you want all the inside scoop on what is going on with KU. You can also follow Michael on Twitter at mswain 247 Joins us every Tuesday at the bottom of the 4 o'clock hour for Jayhawk Weekly. We appreciate the time as always, Michael. We will talk to you soon, my friend. Awesome. Sounds great. Talk to you guys next week. That is Michael Swain from Fog.net. Great, great insight onto everything going on with KU, both on the hardwood and on the gridiron with the Spring Showcase now in the books. 
football camp coming up next, just a few months away. We've got one hour left on 580 Sports Talk today before we send you off to Royals baseball tonight for game two against the White Sox. Coming up in the five o'clock hour, we've got our 580 Sports Talk headlines. Fallout from the failed stadium vote in uh, not a great way for the Chiefs and Royals. Plus, we'll preview White Sox versus Royals. That's coming up after the news on 580 Sports Talk.
580 Sports Talk, the first hour of the show on a Tuesday afternoon. Brendan Dorzinski, Dan Lucero, Spencer Dupuy finishing things out with you today. We've got our headlines. Got some news on the fallout from the failed stadium vote in Kansas City. We'll preview White Sox Royals tonight and tomorrow. We got a late start tomorrow, boys. Yes, we do. We got day baseball. We do. In the shy. And uh, for the Royals, I don't know what the White Sox schedule looks like. I don't know what the weather looks like. The Royals are off on Thursday. The weather doesn't look so good tonight after 8 p.m., I think. I Hmm. looked it up. Because uh, double header tomorrow. Oh, Joe Goldberg posted uh, something about the when he posted the lineup with no Salvi, he said something about the weather in it. So I looked up the weather and it said like after eight or nine p.m. There's storms. Intriguing. Uh, we could get a double header, or they'll just play Thursday. Both teams are off. Yeah, could do that. So you might end up doing that. Uh, we will find out if the, the game gets pushed at some point tonight. So, Royals, White Sox tonight. We are on tomorrow as soon as postgame ends for the series finale. And we'll talk to Fitz tomorrow. We will get you as much as we can during a shortened edition tomorrow of 580 Sports Talk. We're still taking your texts today on the Top City Metal Supply text line, 785-272-9429. And you can drop us a comment on YouTube as well. 580 Sports Talk is the name of our YouTube channel. Gentlemen, are you ready for one final choose your trip contest keyword for the day? Let's go. To enter the contest. He's excited. Pumped up. I love it. 580WIBW.com. That is where you need to go. There is a link right in the center of the homepage. You cannot possibly miss it. It says, choose your trip. Click on that, and you can enter this keyword to be entered into our contest. It only works until 6 o'clock. We'll have new keywords tomorrow, but these only work until 6 o'clock today. Your keyword for the 5 o'clock hour is city. C-I-T-Y. City. Head on over to 580WIBW.com. Enter the keyword at the Choose Your Trip contest from Alpha Media, and hopefully you will be a winner of a trip to anywhere you want to go. Hence, Choose Your Trip. Any city you want to go to. Any city. Look at that symmetry. Well, I actually, to be honest with you, I've got the list of words right in front of me. A lot of them are kind of connected. Some are not. Like, one of the ones we had last week was repost. Um <laughs> I, I, we had another weird one. I can't remember what, what it was. Um, I don't know. Want? I want to go on vacation, maybe? I guess. I guess. Keyword was a keyword last that Monday. Keyword. Why are we using keyword? Oh, it's like when your password is password. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's get to today's 580 Sports Talk headlines. I'm going to go with a little Patrick Mahomes news today. Patrick Mahomes was named to the time 100 most influential people in the world for the second time in his career. In fact, he is one of the cover stars for this year's time 100 issue. That is obviously pretty impressive. I think there are multiple covers, if I'm not mistaken here. Uh, But Patrick Mahomes with his head resting on a football is indeed one of them. Some of the clips from his bio have gone semi-viral on Twitter today, mostly the ones about Taylor Swift, because I mean, let's be frank, anything about Taylor Swift goes viral these days, especially if it pertains to the Kansas City Chiefs. But he talked about everything that went on this year, meeting Taylor Swift. There was a quote from Andy Reid in there about him being upset at his teammates and being mad at the receivers for dropping passes and saying, hey, our season maybe doesn't end the way it does if he was not on his guys about that. That was a big deal. And the Chiefs have said throughout this run to the Super Bowl and throughout the celebration afterward that, hey, getting our ass kicked by the Raiders on Christmas Day, the bad play by the receivers down the stretch, those were all important things to lead the Chiefs to the Super Bowl. And Patrick Mahomes outlines that in his Time Magazine profile. Um, do you know who wrote it? Did you see who who wrote the profile? Alex Rodriguez. A-Rod! That's Which is funny because Derek Jeter wrote the profile of him in 2020 when he was in the top 100 for the first time. <laughs> time Magazine is just trying to remember any baseball players they can. So I'm guessing the next time he's on this list, it's going to be uh, Bernie Williams, perhaps? Or would it have to be another shortstop? 
Yeah, could be. Yeah, could be another uh, Nomar. It'll be Nomar. Nomar. Did his dude, dad... I loved Nomar. I did. <laughs> did, his, did his dad play with Nomar? Because his dad, obviously, Pat Mahomes, uh, played, yeah. played with Alex Rodriguez. So that's the that's the tie there. They were teammates, I think, in Texas. I'm pretty sure they were teammates with the Rangers. Yeah, I think that would make sense. Pat Mahomes, by the way, sneaky, good, immaculate grid answer. Yes, played he for, played for a lot of teams. Yeah, played for a lot of teams. Uh, who else could... Who played for the 1999 Mets? Oh, man. Robin Ventura? Boom. Robin Ventura <laughs> next year. Was it was it Ventura then? Or uh, I'm trying to remember. Because I think he hit the home run in the playoffs. The, um, the Grand Slam single. Wasn't that 99? Yes. Or is that 01? I don't remember. He was on the team regardless. Oh, you want a shortstop? You know who played? Ray Ordonez. Ray Ordonez. Hell Come yeah. On. I know my 1999 Mets. Who played center field? I don't know him that well. 96 man. games. Uh, that nah, didn't. You just used him in an immaculate grid the other day. Ricky Henderson? No, he played left. Ah. Brian McCray. Brian McCray. Royal Gray. Yeah. John Olerud was on the team. Lo Everybody loved John Olerud because he looked like such a doofus <laughs> with that helmet at first mm -hmm. base. There's a possibly <laughs> apocryphal story. Uh, we have mentioned that Ricky Henderson and John Olerud were both on this team. There is a possibly apocryphal story that a couple of years later, John Olerud had since gone to Seattle to play for the Mariners, and they acquired Ricky Henderson. And Ricky Henderson came over to John Olerud, who notably wore a batting helmet due to a head injury he suffered, mm -hmm. I think, in college. Uh, he wore a batting helmet while he played the field. That was like the thing that you identified John Olerud with. He wore yep. the batting helmet. And Ricky Henderson saw John Olerud wearing a batting helmet, taking infield practice, and came up to him and said, you know, that's really funny. I play with a guy in New York who did the same thing. And Olerud said, Ricky, that was me. <laughs> <laughs> That's tremendous. That story has been uh, debunked, but when the legend becomes fact. It's a, it's a great story. Printed. Never let the truth get in the way of a good story. I think Aaron Rodgers said that today, in fact. Anyway, Pat Mahomes, he is, Patrick Mahomes, excuse me, one of your time 100 most influential people in the world for 2024. He had some uh, interesting quotes in there about Taylor Swift, too, in the, yeah. in the profile. People have been, Chiefs people, have been so kind about her. and said, Yeah, I mean, I didn't get distracted. He, he said that when asked, you know, was it distracting when she became such a big part of the narrative? He said, hey, we, we want to keep it fun. Like, it, it was fun. We got to do our business, but it, it was fun. Um, also, the, the quotes about, you know, learning football and asking, why can't you do this? I thought were very, very funny. I saw <laughs> someone on Twitter say, no, that was all of us Swifties. Like, yeah. we all were asking this. I'm glad they understand. <laughs> like, no, that, that's why I thought this was great. And I, you know, I, I gave Jake a lot of you-know-what because he wanted to talk about it so often. But it, grand scheme of things, definitely a positive for the NFL. More people who like football and sports and are into it is a good thing. Yes, it brought more people to the game. And people who already are wired to be passionate about mm -hmm. a thing and uh, that is like word one you would use to describe the Swifties, right? Yes. Passionate. They also became passionate about this new fascination of their favorite musical artist, which was the sport of football. And how many stories did we hear about like dads who said, my 15-year-old daughter never wanted to watch a game with me. Now we watch games all day Sunday. Yeah, yeah. they did a whole. It's awesome. They did a whole segment about that on uh Sunday NFL countdown yeah. the day of the Super Bowl. Yeah. It, it was really cool. So yeah, yeah, that's that's been a net plus for like everybody involved here. You will not be surprised to know she was also on the list. <laughs> How about that? <laughs> all right, what's your first headline today, Dan? All right, we have some sad news from the world of baseball to report. Whitey Herzog passed away on Monday at the age of 92 after an illness. Herzog managed the Kansas City Royals for three consecutive AL West division titles from 1976 to 1978 before moving on to even greater acclaim as the manager of the St. Louis Cardinals from 1980 to 1990. There, Herzog won three National League pennants and the 1982 World Series. In 18 years as a manager, Herzog won 1,281 games. All of his pennants and his one World Series title were won in St. Louis. It is rare to have had a manager in Major League Baseball have a style of play that is as identifiable with them as Whitey Herzog did with what came to be known 
as Whitey Ball. Lots of speed, lots of stolen bases, doubles and triples on the AstroTurf. Not a lot of power. Mm -hmm. Excellent defense. That was Whitey Ball. Whitey Herzog once said, if you get good enough pitching and play good enough defense, you can win games on the moon. Uh, I'm paraphrasing here, but uh, that is uh, that that's uh, <laughs> that's one, the gist of it. Yeah, that's that's the the gist of it. And certainly his Royals teams of the late '70s, who again won three consecutive American League East championships, uh, the best of the bunch, the 1977 team that won 102 games, just couldn't get past those damn Yankees in the playoffs. But those were great teams, and those were again teams that were not necessarily known for the long ball. In 1977, the Royals had no player hit more than 23 home runs, so they did have four players go over 20 home runs. They did, however, finish second in the American League with 170 stolen bases and hit 277 as a team that year. Herzog understood the advantage that speed could be on the hard AstroTurf at the old Royal Stadium. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is the same Royal State, but it's the old AstroTurf. You guys yeah. know what I'm talking about here. And uh, encouraged contact and getting up and going on the bases and uh, had a lot of exciting players, of course, in his uh, tenure as the Royals manager and as the Cardinals manager. Um, a great baseball life. Also played for a very long time. There's a great quote of his uh, in this. Uh, I'm, I'm reading the obituary from uh, the St. Louis uh post-dispatch, and uh, he had a quote about his playing days. He played from 1956 to 1963 uh, for the then-Washington Senators, the Kansas City A's, uh, Baltimore, and Detroit, and uh, once famously said, baseball has been very good to me since I quit trying to play it. (laughs) So one of the more colorful characters in the game, if you ever get a chance to read, uh, he wrote a couple of books. The one he wrote second after his baseball days had ended he was no longer affiliated with the team Uh, it was called you're missing a great game it's a very fun read uh it's a very entertaining read uh and uh is somebody who gave a lot to the game and was uh obviously celebrated on both sides of the i-70 rivalry Whitey herzog passed away today at age 92 and i'm sure formative in uh i know we have many many listeners who've been royals fans for a very long time and uh perhaps formative in your baseball viewing experience and and maybe that's still the baseball that is the most appealing to your eye the speed and defense and pitching and daring do on the base paths uh that uh whitey herzog brought to the game as the royals and cardinals manager i mean it really kind of set up the next however many years of royals baseball right i mean that's kind of the way the royals have played for a lot of their history. It was their identity for many, yeah. many years. And even in the more modern era, the Royals team that won the 2015 World Series certainly would not have been out of place uh, as a Whitey Herzog team, a team that, uh, of course, had a lot of speed and, and didn't hit uh, a ton of home runs. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, played great defense all over the diamond, had a bunch of multi, you know, gold glove winners or gold glove finalists at, at, at a variety of different positions. Yeah, it was very much a Whitey Herzog kind of team, even though they haven't played on that AstroTurf for a <laughs> very, very long time. But uh, one sliding doors moment that I find to be fascinating, uh, he very seriously considered being the first general manager in Colorado Rockies history when oh. they were not yet playing games but hiring a front office. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were very interested in hiring Whitey Herzog. Instead, he took the job with the then California Angels to be their general oh. manager instead and uh, said it was because he didn't have to start from scratch. It'll be the same challenge, but I don't have to start from scratch. Makes sense. And uh, he was the general manager there. But I'm I'm fascinated because we're going on now 32 years of nobody being able to figure out what wins at altitude, what wins in Denver consistently. wonder what kind of ideas Whitey Herzog might have had about that. Um, speaking of the Rockies, I mentioned earlier that we don't have to my, speak uh, of the Rockies ever again. Well, it's a big day though. I, I mentioned <laughs> earlier, it's the anniversary of my wedding. It's a big anniversary for you as well. <laughs> Are you talking about 30 that? years, 30 since years, the, the birth of Dinger, 30 years since the birth of Dinger. I was at the game. I'm sure I've told this story on the air before. I know I've told you I was at the game at the old mile high stadium where Dinger hatched. 
the whole conceit of the mascot was they found actual dinosaur bones on mm -hmm. the site where they were building Coors Field. So in year two, they introduced a Rockies mascot, year two of the organization, and they brought out this big fake dinosaur egg before a game. They were playing the Expos. They brought out the egg, and the egg hatched, and out came Dinger. And I just remember, you ever hear 65,000 people go, what the hell is that in unison? <laughs> That, that's what it was at uh, Mile High Stadium that afternoon. I was eight years old, and even I didn't think it was cool. But uh, Dinger really, though, is very much a microcosm of uh, of what, like, the Rockies are as an organization. Like, yeah, we know it's goofy and bad, but you're not allowed to make fun of it. Only we are. Splayed out on the ground, rolling around, trying to stand up. It, it, it's, it's goofy, but it's ours. <laughs> <laughs> Happy anniversary Thank to you. Dinger. Thank you. Spencer, what do you got for headlines today? Uh, we talked about this, I think, Last week or the week before that it was a possibility that he could be going into this, that there was talk about it, but mm -hmm. it's now official. Travis Kelsey is going into the game show business via James Hibbard of Hollywood Reporter. Chiefs tight end Travis Kelsey will host Are You Smarter Than a Celebrity on Amazon Prime? As Amazon has now ordered 20 episodes of the show, which will have adult contestants answering sixth grade level questions with the assistance of celebrities, obviously a spinoff of Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? Uh, but we talked about it before being a possibility that he w was wanting to do this, but Amazon has now greenlit it. So I'm glad to know that it's not just Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader with no children, because that would have been a real waste of our time. I'm glad to know that it is actually just a different show. Yeah. Um, can we get to this quote from Travis <laughs> Kelsey? This, I've never... If you know anything about the guy, I don't think Travis Kelsey's dumb by any means, no. but I also don't think he's, you know, one of the great wordsmiths in American history. <laughs> yes. Listen to this statement from him. I grew up loving game shows, and I'm excited to be following in the footsteps of so many TV icons by hosting my very first one with Are You Smarter Than a Celebrity? The original show is a great success, so to be bringing a new format with everyone's favorite celebrities to the screen will definitely be entertaining. I'm just happy to be on the hosting side of the equation here and excited to see how these famous faces keep up. <laughs> so this PR person, his manager, his agent, who do you think wrote that? Oh, Did Amazon just attach his name to it and he signed off? I, I feel like he could very well have uh, been responsible for writing that. We we have seen his old tweets. <laughs> yeah. No, these are spelled. This whole thing is spelled correctly, though. I don't know if it could be his. Also, every, every now and again, I think about him tweeting. I just gave a squirrel a piece of bread and squirrels <laughs> spelled like an E at the end. Like it just not even close. Not even close. Also, they produced more than 3000 episodes of Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader? What? Yeah, that was my thought when I read that. So if I watched an episode of Are You Smarter Than a Fifth Grader every day, it would take me almost 10 years is what you're telling that me. That seems impossible. Globally. So across the globe. Okay. Oh, all right. Like okay, yeah, the American version, uh, 118 episodes. Okay, I feel a lot better now. Oh, my God. It is a, it's a great concept for a show. <laughs> Jeff Foxworthy, 3,000 episodes. Oh, no. Dude, I love Jeff Foxworthy. I'm not afraid to say it. I, I really like Jeff Foxworthy. I think he's very funny. Yeah. Uh, did you know one person won the $100,000? I'm sorry. Three people won the maximum prize, which on Nickelodeon was 100000 On Fox and syndication was $1 million. One of them was Kathy Cox, the superintendent of public schools for the state of Georgia. The other was George Smoot, the 2006 Nobel Prize winner in physics, who's also a professor at Berkeley. <laughs> I'm glad they won. Good for them. Yes. Glad they were able to win that. Next headline for me today, quick one from college football, K-State, with a couple of schedule changes today. They have scheduled a new home-and-home -home series with Oregon State. The Beavers will be coming to Manhattan. Get your calendars ready for 2030. Six years from now, got to gotta mark the dates off. The first three weeks of the season, you're going to be busy with K-State football taking on Oregon State. Uh, K-State will make the return trip to Corvallis in 2031. Meanwhile, K-State, I'm surprised by this. They have scrapped their series with Rutgers. I did not know that. I didn't see that part. Yes, I, I didn't either when I posted the news story to 580wibw.com today. I and was going to say, because if they did, they would have two two away games in 2031. Exactly. Yeah. I feel like you could have altered that, but 
So be it. Uh, they will now be playing Oregon State, not Rutgers, come 2030 and 2031. Next headline for me last night was the three-round, 36-pick WNBA draft. And in a startling development, Iowa's Caitlin Clark was the number one overall pick. She went to the Indiana Fever. It is not at all a startling development. That was sarcasm. The league is well aware of her potential impact, have scheduled 34 of Indiana's 38 regular season games for some kind of national television broadcast. Clark, the number one overall pick, was followed by Stanford star post Cameron Brink, who went number two. She'll stay on the West Coast and play for the L.A. Galaxy. The Chicago Sky took the maybe two other best post players in America yes. with a pair of first-round picks, taking Camilla Cardoso of South Carolina at number three overall and Angel Reese of LSU with the number seven pick. They said, bleep shooting. We're just going to get every rebound. You're going to kick your ass in the post. <laughs> That's the whole approach, and I... Love it. Ricky, Sky up. <laughs> Rakia Jackson went number four to uh, the Los Angeles Sparks. Galax uh, I said Galaxy. Sparks. My apologies. Uh, Wrong gender and sport. Yeah, correct. Uh, <laughs> the Dallas Wings had the fifth overall pick. Took Ohio State shooting guard J.C. Sheldon. UConn power forward Aaliyah Edwards went to the Washington Mystics at number six overall as well. In the second round, former Kansas Jayhawk Ayanna Jackson was selected by the Connecticut Sun. Yeah. The 6'6 center will have a chance to break in at the pro ranks and provides rim protection that the Sun have been lacking. 2.4 million people watched the WNBA draft. That is the first time it has had a TV audience of more than 1 million viewers. It is a comparable number to day two of the NFL draft, which last year got 2.6 million viewers there is an audience for mm -hmm. this stuff and the league announced last night that it is looking into expanding from its current 12 team iteration listing a number of cities as possible dest uh, destinations for expansion they've already got one team sewed up in golden's at golden state or the, the bay yeah the bay area uh that will uh, debut next season the goal is to get the league to 18 teams which would be good for the league because they're there are too many good players and not enough teams right now for the league. Yeah. Like there is plenty of room for them to expand. Uh, the goal, uh, according to the league's commissioners, to have 18 teams by 2028. I think a WNBA team in Kansas City would be tremendously successful. Well, too, I think it for them, I think they're going to latch on because it's a partnership with the NBA. Right, it has been yes. Yeah, like, that's most why... of their their or the whole organization is a part. So I would figure that a lot of these teams are in, gonna going to be in NBA cities. That that is certainly possible, but I I also think it's worth noting that Nashville was one of the cities that okay. was mentioned as a possible uh ex uh expansion destination. And Hartford course, has a team. Yeah, the. Connecticut, I, well, obviously. I think it's Hartford. Uh, it's they, in Connecticut. They play at the casino. They play at, at the Mohegan Sun. Yeah. yeah, they play at the Mohegan Sun. That's why they're named the Connecticut Sun. Right. Um, so I don't know that necessarily they have to go to yeah. NBA cities. And if that's the case, I think Kansas City, again, would be a great place for a WNBA team. Well, because your point makes sense. Like, go to a place that already has a basketball ready arena for them. Kansas City just so happens to have, have one without having an NBA team. It's it's a weird setup, but I I think people would love it in uh, in Kansas City. I've said this before the handful of times the WNBA has come up. The re the biggest reason they need to expand is you're not going to trim the draft. You're not going to do the MLB thing and suddenly say we're going to eliminate a third of the draft with twelve teams. And 12 player rosters. You know how many players that is per how many players in the whole league that is at any given time? 144. Right. Good job. I can actually do math. 144 players. They have 12 picks per round for three rounds. That's 36 players. That means every single year, in theory, you could turn over 25% of your league roster in the draft. That that's you want to talk about unsustainable. Yeah, they they openly talk about like some of the third round picks, like, yeah, they, they might not make the team. Yes, there are first round, there are top five picks that three years later are out of the WNBA because they're just like pretty solid, but mm -hmm. they don't have room. So if they added six expansion teams, I know this is obviously a hypothetical talk. 
how would you have expansion drafts for that many teams? There, there's a big talent pool of free agents. I, I guess, I, yeah, yeah. You know, would you be able to get a player from like? Would you just one team would be able to? Yeah, teams teams would probably protect like you know nine of their twelve players and shoot. I think you may. I think you would make it even smaller. Honestly, yeah. I, I think what they would need to do is to thin the pool out a little yeah. bit. So you yeah. say like. Okay, Indiana, because they had the number one pick. Mm-hmm. Y- you get to protect two players. Okay, well, they're going to protect Caitlin Clark and Aaliyah Boston. And then everybody else. Like, but I mm-hmm. think that's the way you do it because it's just so concentrated. It's a good product. Yeah. And yeah, people and, are going to watch Caitlin Clark. And, and I wish I wish that I had a tie, whether it was my hometown or a local team, to the league. So I could, like, it's hard for me to invest in Connecticut playing Phoenix in any sport, really. So it'd be nice to have a, a local way to get involved, whether it would be me personally or whether it would be all of us. If we had a team an hour down the road, I promise you, like we would. Hell yeah, we would, we would cover we'd it. Be there. Hell yeah, we would. That'll do it for today's 5 Eddie Sports Talk headlines. Coming up next, the Chiefs and the Royals. Just how much did they spend on that failed vote in Kansas City for the stadium tax? We'll tell you next on 5 Eddie Sports Talk. We didn't get to the biggest headline of the day from the sports business world. The NFL has officially named Applebee's the official bar and grill of the National Football League. What? Yeah. The bees. You think is there there one here? You think? Yeah. 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 17th in uh, Wanamaker. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Just over there. Yeah. Mm. It's behind the Best Buy. 
Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. By the dance studio you could and the McDonald's. There, you could be there and having a dollarita in like five minutes after the show. Okay. So they did those commercials last football season. Like dollaritas are back. Yes. If you look, sounds like an intestinal disease. If you look closely, the way they did it, they had tweets pop up like you asked for it and we did it. We brought it back. The dollar. <laughs> ah, ah, ah. They used to do like a dollar drink a month. Yes. So if you look at that commercial, the first tweet that pops up that says like, I would kill myself for a dollar right now. The same account just tweeted about it a bunch and half the tweets they show on the screen are from the same person. <laughs> so pretty much one person was tweeting at them to bring back the Dollarita or they would like inhale toaster water and they brought it back. <laughs> that that's the that's the narrative I've chosen to believe with the Dollarita. I like the dollar Long Island iced teas. <laughs> like you, you're putting police to work there because you gotta station one outside of your Applebee's location if you're selling Long Islands for a buck. Do you remember the uh um the Applebee's story that ended up on what is wrong with you one time, the gender reveal at the Applebee's <laughs> yeah, in the got in the lot. fight in the parking lot. Yeah. <laughs> Every other day at an Applebee's would be gender honest. reveal at the Applebee's. <laughs> hey, listen, this is not Applebee's slander. We are not here to slander the bee. Nah, man. Riblets. Cheap been bar food sounds good, man. Really good to me in my life. <laughs> They have been there for me when I have needed them. <laughs> this quote is insane. Applebee's fans are NFL fans, which is why we. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at this commercial. Watch yes. Yeah. At watch yes. Multiple times. At watch yes. Yeah. Applebee's fans are NFL fans, which is why we are excited to bring America's favorite bar and grill together with America's number one sport. Come on, man. <laughs> All right. Uh, by the way, some baseball news for you. We'll get to Royal Royals White Sox in a little bit after our next commercial break. Uh, the tarp is out on the south side of Chicago. Oh, dear. It is indeed raining. Uh, it doesn't look like it's going to be terrible. I'm going to I'm a couple of credits shy of my meteorology degree, but it looks like this will pass at some point around eh, even before first pitch ish. So they should get this game in maybe a little bit delayed, but they should get this game in tonight. If I had to assume this has been talking Doppler on five of sports talk. Um, <laughs> we had text from the seven, eight, five uh, regarding Applebee's, the new official bar and grill of the national football league. <laughs> the country artist needs some cred for Applebee's resurgence. No, not even wrong. a country artist. no, Incorrect. I, well, I I only know him as the Applebee's guy. Like he's just the Applebee's guy to me. I don't know his name. I don't want to know his name. Don't tell me his name. I just know that he's the Applebee's guy, and I guarantee you his agent is on the phone to the National Football League. Oh yeah. Okay. Do you remember? We're talking about some Applebee's <laughs> and the NFL. Do you remember when he performed live at Arrowhead last year during the playoffs? Was it last year? It was the AFC Championship game. It was the 22 <laughs> season. Because the the CBS crew was at the game, they were on the field, and they couldn't hear each other. Was Boomer that, Esiason is like, yeah. what are you talking about? No, I don't no, know what you're saying. I remember this, and then no, that was was that was that two years ago, or was that three years ago when they blew the halftime lead to the Bengals? Oh, maybe it was. Maybe it was. It was one of the AFC Championship games. It was probably then because that's when that song was popular. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was. They, they, they that might have been that godforsaken Applebee's song at halftime, and that more than any other reason is why the Chiefs blew that lead and lost the AFC. <laughs> That's okay, yeah. About yes. that, yes, that was <laughs> all time great sports television moment. Remember when the SEC network was going to use one of his songs as like their promo for the season, and everybody replied to their video with, like, Yeah, don't do that. This song sucks, <laughs> and the SEC never touched it again, no, never brought it up. Just abandoned it completely. Hey, I, look, get, get them checks. I'm sure his family's eating real good in the neighborhood. Oh, I'm, I'm sure they are. So this was reported on today by the Kansas City Star, this unrelated to Applebee's and the NFL. But, you know, the NFL at least. How much money do you think the Royals and Chiefs spent campaigning for the vote yes on the stadium sales tax this year? They spent a lot of money with Valley Sports. Yes, a lot of commercials. A lot of commercials. How about this? It will go down, according to the Kansas City Star, 
as the most expensive ballot campaign in Kansas City history. Six million dollars and counting. The committee to keep the Chiefs and Royals spent at least $5.7 million to promote the stadium tax ballot measure that suffered defeat in the start of this month. Exactly two weeks ago today, in fact. Nearly twice the team's previously reported contributions to the campaign. It is the most ever spent in support of a local ballot issue in the Kansas City area. The previous high, $5.2 million in 2004, when the teams spent that much money in an effort to pass the unsuccessful Buy State 2 sales tax campaign to benefit the Chiefs, Royals, and the arts community. Here is what this is telling me. Stop working together. <laughs> <laughs> that is... If you are keeping track at home, $10.9 million on the low end just on failed sales tax referendums. Stop pairing up together. This is not working for you guys. This, this partnership has not worked. Can you imagine spending that much money on just a failed vote? Spend the money on building the stadium, man. Use that money for something else. Use that money to go pay for another free agent reliever. <laughs> that is astounding. But I believe it. I mean, we all got hounded by those ads everywhere we went. There's, there was no way to avoid it. But yeah, crazy, crazy amount to then get your butts beaten. This, I, You've already heard my opinion on this. I do not need to mm -hmm. relitigate something that has already gone final. Maybe you should have spent some of that money to build a better campaign. Yeah. <laughs> That's or, what it comes down to. Or you rally your base. Like you, The people that are inclined to vote for you obviously took, you for, took it for granted. And maybe you took them for granted a little bit too. Like you needed, to, you needed to rally your voters because the other side sure did. Yeah. I... <laughs> And, you know, <laughs> just it, it, can't, it can't just be the spending of money. It can't just be ads. Like you gotta, you gotta get out there and sell your vision to the people. Are and you telling? Are are you telling me that having Casey Wolf and Slugger show up at a couple of places and then throwing a big thing for Quentin Lucas, who we all knew endorsed it, to officially endorse it was not a good rallying cry? I, it was not a way to convey your message to the people that you needed to have vote for you. It was not. But like, the thing about rich folks is sometimes they don't know how to talk to people who aren't rich folks. <laughs> That, I mean, I get it. Like socioeconomic be, divide. Be, being as blunt as they can be. Uh, we've got some more thoughts from the YouTube comments about Applebee's. Uh, one, Dan, do not look at the comment section because someone told you who sang the song. Vance! I'll, I'll have forgotten by the time I, my head hits the pillow tonight. I'm not upset. Also, after that quote from the NFL's marketing agents uh, about Applebee's fans are NFL fans, which is so funny, I can't believe it. Christopher says, fans of ritualistic <laughs> cult murders are also NFL fans. Don't feel special. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I am. Don't feel special either. I'm an NFL fan. Like, that's not exactly a high bar, guys. I wouldn't want to be a part of any club that would have me, right? <laughs> right. No kidding. <laughs> Coming up next, the Royals will take on the White Sox twice before we talk to you next. We'll preview those games. Coming up, this is 580 Sports Talk.
Chopper 580's official weather report is that we should be able to have baseball tonight on the south side of Chicago. And it'll be Royals versus White Sox game two of the series. The White Sox have the worst record in baseball and the worst in the history of the franchise through 16 games. They are two and 14. Your Royals through 17 games are 11 and six. It'll be Brady Singer tonight. Jonathan Cannon on the mound for the White Sox. Back-to-back games, the White Sox will have someone making their first career start taking the bump. Um, Not usually a great thing when it's April and you have no good prospects. Not good prospects as in players. Good prospects as in the prospects for the season are bleak. Yeah. Yeah. They also don't have a lot of good prospects. Well, they also don't have. Yeah, not not a lot of, like, top 100 guys in the the the, White Sox chain. The Royals come in as the second-best starting pitcher ERA in the league. Uh, Most innings thrown. And uh, the starters come in with 15 consecutive scoreless innings. It's been awesome, man. It's been awesome baseball to watch lately. With the Royal, I love good pitching. I always, almost always, almost always would take a pitcher's duel over a slugfest. Like, I love a good 2-1, 3-1 kind of baseball game. So Absolutely. To see yeah. the Royals doing what they are doing right now has been especially fun for me personally. It's just so much more watchable when you're not walking the freaking ballpark. That yep. was the thing that was the hardest to watch. Really, the last couple of years about the Royals, their pitchers wouldn't throw strikes. Oh my gosh, throw strikes! I'm begging them to throw strikes. And this year, they're they are raiding the zone and raining the zone and all of those things, all of those slogans from all those t-shirts. <laughs> they're, they're they're finally doing it, and uh, we'll see if Brady Singer can keep up his really strong start. Three really good starts so far for Brady, and uh, a chance again against a, a lineup that is struggling. You want to keep. Struggling teams struggling. This is an adage that is true in every single sport. I've probably said it a dozen times, at least, on this radio program. Keep struggling teams struggling. That's what you want to do if you're the Royals. Put your foot down. Go get game two tonight. No Salvi in the lineup. We mentioned it uh, Mm -hmm. earlier. Uh, Another day off for him today. They want to give him one more day so that he's 100%. But he is available tonight. So uh, you could see him in a pinch hitting role, but he's not getting the start. Freddie Fermin is going to catch. Probably, too, if he's hurt and there's any rain yeah be careful you, with it you probably want to be careful because i mean it's a groin mm-hmm. right you know, it's no time you slip you absolutely can, could yeah. be a factor yeah also why mess around with the white Sox? that too i mean <laughs> I just, if you don't need him why use him i maybe he's a pinch hitter tonight if needs if you need him to be uh but yeah why mess around how about this the royals are the second biggest favorite there's a couple games that have already started but of all the games still to come tonight the Royals are the second biggest favorite in Major League Baseball tonight. Wow. Minus 198 on the money line. So to win 100 bucks, you'd have to put down $198. That is impressive. Spencer, I regret to inform you the biggest favorite of the night is the Los Angeles dollar, dollars. The Los Angeles <laughs> Dodgers. They did spend a lot of time. Not, they did. not inaccurate. No. A Freudian slip there. The Los Angeles Dodgers, they are minus 275 against your Nationals. Patrick Corbin on the mound. Well, there's your reason uh, why. Don't, don't need to know. He stinks. Let me go Counting bet. down the number of starts till he's not a Nats pitcher anymore. Let me go bet yes run first inning in that game. Uh, game, I'm very excited for. You want a pitcher's duel? I'm very excited for Logan Gilbert, Hunter Green tonight. Ooh, that could be fun. Mariners versus Reds. I love how the Nats Dodgers is the MLB TV free game of the day. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't yeah. do this to us? Give people Otani and bets for free. I'm I'm all for that. Uh, there is another game tonight, by the way. Game two of the series between the Cardinals and the A's. Did you see what happened to the Cardinals last night? I did not. No. So they, they wanted, lost. They wanted to challenge a call. They did not get the rule, like the announcement, in on time that they wanted to challenge it because Ali Marmol, their manager, the for St. Louis, got screened briefly by a, a security guard. Like, he walked in front of Marmol, and it threw off the whole operation, and they didn't let the re- the umps know in time like that they the, wanted to review it. Is it because he was starting to walk up, and when you walk up, like, security guards will walk out? Yeah. Yeah, and the security guard just sort of walked in front of him. and That's ridiculous. Like, I don't remember. I'd make was, sure that, is it, was it a home game for them? Uh, it was no, in they were in Oakland. Yeah, it was in Oakland. Yeah, and the, uh, the security guard, he threw his hands up, like, hey, man, I'm sorry. But the umpire said, no, we... You didn't get it in on time. Speaking of challenges, did you see the AAA pitcher challenges now? The 
the balls and strike. Ball yeah. Strike. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen Did that. You see... I've seen that live in action. I saw it at a Florida State League game I was at last year. Uh, it works great. They should implement it in Major League Baseball immediately. It is very <laughs> unobtrusive and uh, it works and it might save Angel Hernandez's job. Well, who's the, now I'm forgetting his name. Who's the Pirates pitcher? Uh, prospect Paul Skeens. 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 So yeah. Skeens got like three calls right over the weekend or something. He just, he wow. threw the like you have to throw the pitch and then tap your head. Pitchers are the smartest guys on the diamond. They know what a strike is. Yeah. And they call to the ball and then like 30, like apparently they show it on the big screen. Oh. And then they show where the ball goes. And okay. then it, every single, like within 10 seconds of so yeah, challenging. They, they've got the new system now. They didn't have that in the Florida State League last year, but the mm -hmm. new system is like Hawkeye and tennis. Yeah. Basically, you, you, you challenge it. You see it up on the big board, and we go about our day. Uh, real quick, Royals White Sox will finish up their series tomorrow. It is going to be Michael Waka versus Eric Fetty. Do the Royals Fetty. get a sweep? Yes, I think they sweep. Sweep? Well, they got to win tonight. Well, yeah, I think I, they I will. Think they'll win tonight. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm calling sweep. Get the brooms out. Yeah, we will wrap up five eighty Sports Talk right after this commercial break with the final word. Dan, you're up first with today's final word. Final word for me is it may not, it's not 162 games yet. Obviously it's not even really 40 games yet, but uh, we can know, I think what the Royals are not and what they are not is the Chicago White Sox. And, and we should all be very, very grateful that they are not the Chicago White Sox. Final word for me is that I am officially a Kansas resident with a driver's license from the state of Kansas. There we go. Uh, and I just watched the funniest video on a Facebook page called It's Topeka, My Dudes. Ah, uh, yes. I also and recently became yeah, a yeah, member. You're yeah. a real resident. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's a guy, it's a person driving their car down a sidewalk <laughs> somewhere in Topeka near a Spangles. I mean, that could be anywhere. Yeah, it doesn't narrow it down at all. <laughs> uh, but I just, I literally just saw it right when we were about to come back, and I can't stop cracking up. Final word for me today. Reason to be excited about this Royals team. I get it if you feel like you've been beaten down by how bad the last half decade has been, and frankly, probably a lot of your life as a Royals fan. But at the very least, 
get excited about some of the young guys who are playing like they are 10-year vets and MVP candidates. Oh, by the way, Bobby Witt Jr. is at DraftKings. He is the second shortest odds in baseball to an American League MVP. Cole Reagans, as of the start of the day, fourth shortest odds to an AL Cy Young. At least get on the bandwagon for those guys and support them the rest of the way. Royals baseball is coming up next. We are on after the finale tomorrow. For Dan, for Spencer, I'm Brendan. This has been 580 Sports Talk.